City Council for our budget session agenda. Uh, we are. Hmm? <laughs> the pro temp says hammer again. <laughs> hammer it again. I uh, call to order the Waverly City Council for our budget session. Um, we have a lot of agenda to cover. I'd like to begin by looking to our city administrator. Could you give an overview uh, where we're at here a little bit, and lead us in, and, sure. and then uh, take leadership from there? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Make sure my microphone's on here. Um, as most of you will recall, last week we started with kind of a broad overview to the general fund uh, property tax supported departments. And we talked about kind of where we are coming into the budget, uh, some different ideas, historical growth and valuation. Uh, as folks will recall, taxable values are up about 1.2% this year. And that's a combination of uh, natural, naturally occurring growth and changes to the state rollback. Uh, we talked through the police department, uh, leisure services, and the library, since those are primarily property tax funded and had an overview. And we also talked about the concept of using a portion of the state backfill from the commercial and industrial rollback to set aside for contingency planning. And we had some, had some good discussion on that. And after last week, what we did is we reduced that set aside kind of stabilization reserve figure down and we use that in the budget to move the tax levy rate from where we had it at $14.15 last week to uh, $14, well, $14.0483. Some say $14.05, but I like the four in there. So, <laughs> um, so we were able to do that effectively, keeping uh, money, and we'll talk about that, uh, uh, keeping uh, 160 some thousand in that stabilization reserve for good contingency planning and lowering the property tax rate to offset about a third of the rollback increase that homeowners will see, and to provide even a greater benefit to commercial and industrial property. So uh, we've worked through that. That factors in. Uh, that didn't make very many changes to the budget. We did uh, move the pay for volunteer fire calls and meetings from $5 to $10. We had talked about 15, but we weren't quite able to make that work with everything else this year. But we are making that change. You'll see uh, when we look at the overall general fund, the expenditures for next year are just a little over six million now because of an ambulance. We had saved that money. It's not increasing a net change. It's just calling for that purchase next year. Um, we've added a little bit to general capital improvement fund for some of the projects we talked about that we'll go through today and just updated it. So today, what we'd like to do now at nine o'clock is we'd like to, if you turn to your uh, health and social services tab, uh, we'd like to talk about citizen requests and contributions to others. We have some representatives here from different areas, um, and that is this really bright kind of safety yellow uh, sheet, uh, sheets in your book. And we would just uh, like to, if, if folks are here, give them about five minutes to talk about their requests, and so council can make a determination on how to fund those. If you're not funding them, I can throw them up on, online. They're towards the front, yep, uh, right before leisure services and after kind of streets and public works. <coughs> so as we go through that, it's really, um, I'm going to kind of bow out of that process and let those folks discuss their requests and then council can discuss that. Uh, as staff, we would just like direction on funding levels and, and uh, we can talk about how we would, how we would fund any or, or all of those requests. Uh, and then once that's finished, we'll just pick up where we left off. We have economic development, community development, um, executive admin and legislative and legal and finance, and then we get into uh, our infrastructure departments like water, sewer, solid waste, road use, and the airport. So I think we'll just kind of walk through here. Um, and the first one we have here on our. Uh, Phil, um, before we get started on that, what's that number again on the that's on the reserve stabilization fund? Let me get that for you, Tim. General fund balance. Uh, so after, so after next year. So basically, throughout the year, we'll fund it when we get the backfill. But at the end of six thirty of twenty sixteen, that number will be one eighty six nine sixty five, and we're initially funding that with sixty six thousand dollars from the general fund reserve. That's the three percent above our thirty percent target. Okay. So that'll be immediately. 
and then the backfill number we're putting in there now instead of 220 is 12646. So that will leave us at the end of the year moving ahead with about 187,000. Okay. That, but that kind of as we go into some of these requests Keep that is, in mind is a something that we could pull and and still stay at net neutral on what we're looking at in the budget. Right? That's correct. And that's what we would offer as a source of revenue for this would be probably that reserve. We'd like to see some money left in there, but that's a number that you can um, adjust without having it impact that $14.05 levy rate. So the first uh, group I'd like to call up is uh, the Heritage Days. Uh, we've received letters from them in some discussion. I know they have a good showing this morning, and so if anybody representing or speaking for them would like to address the council, we have some time for that now. Do you guys have any visuals or anything? No. I didn't bring any. Do you bring any visuals? We like good stories. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Jess. They have an email to them, I guess. Um, you have to speak right into that mic or it doesn't sorry. pick up. There you go. Can I move it? Yep. You can even carry it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, no, sorry. Um, my name is Jess Hamilton, as most of you know, co chair of Waverly Heritage Days. Denise Timmerman, a past member for uh, 10 years. <clears throat> so called on some of their expertise from the past for today. I believe an email was mailed out to you last night um, regarding uh, what we plan to do, how much we really spend the whole weekend costs us. Um, just kind of asking, you know, when you're looking at the budget, we would really appreciate um, the $5,000. Any amount of money is great for us. Um, but looking at how much we're trying to do I believe in that email it was attached that we will have six vendors there this um, this year. We will also be adding a Hall of Fame, which we're including a DJ with. So that's um, some more funding. We are going to have the Hall of Fame, Vic Ferrari, Saturday. We're going to have <clears throat> a slew of kids' activities. We have a 5K that we are not pro – we're not hosting it, but the – Local cross country club has, or cross country team has asked us to um, promote for them. So they're going to run a cross country, um, a 5K on the Warburg cross country course is their hope. And I know the time there said it was gonna be at 6 p.m. on Friday night, but they've moved it to Saturday morning at eight. Um, we're also gonna look at including um, a, a guy by the name of Rob Bevins for duck calling. Um, he's known nationally. Um, Richie Lee in the fabu Fabulous 50s, karaoke, uh, bingo night, uh, movie night for the kids. All of these things are things that we're trying to put in place that are going to cost us more funding. So that would be why we're asking for the increase in um, donations. We're also looking at adding, as we said, the Sunday, Coleman Park, um, doing an ice cream social where we'll have a band. We'll also have ice cream, the creative co-op that is trying to start up in Waverly. Also would like to do something possibly on Sunday. Um, so that's just some of the various things that we have that we'd like to incorporate this year. But again, that takes more funding. Um, I don't know. I have a few. Yes, please. Um, my husband, David, and I started on Heritage Days Committee about 10 years ago with um, Donna Kay Oberhoy then. Um, she taught us a lot. And when we joined the committee, our liaison was Gary Borum. And just to take a few seconds about Gary, he was always at the meetings. He inputted ideas. He didn't vote on things, but he gave us a lot of great ideas. He helped on the radio sites or interviews. Um, about Heritage Days weekend with Kayway. He, um, if we had trouble with anything with the city, and I'm not saying that we did, but he was our go-between. He was right there for us all the time. We said, Gary, could you help us with this? Don't worry about it, it's taken care of. So the liaison is a very important part of Heritage Days to connect the city. And we're also missing somebody from the fire department. Um, we had Bob Pfizer and he resigned from the committee, and we don't have a liaison there. So maybe it is extra special to have somebody from city council, maybe two, to 
step in for the fire department too, maybe. Anyway, I just wanted to say that about Gary. We always appreciated his help. He gave us good insight. Um, as a, my husband Dave is still on the committee. He works with entertainment. I, I stepped off the committee last fall. But we have been contacted um, the last couple of weeks by people from the community about what is happening with the Waverly Heritage Days Committee. Personally, I just want to say um, I've worked too hard and I spent a lot of time, 10 years. I think people don't realize how much time you spend at home on this nightly, especially as the event draws closer. And Dave and I have spent our own funds on the committee, so we really, really don't want to see the event fail. We want to see it continue to thrive. We feel like when we started on the committee, it was a small event. But now we're drawing Friday night 4,000 people to town. I know they're coming from Wisconsin. They're coming from Minnesota. They're coming all from all over Iowa. And we have people from Illinois that are coming too. And they stay. They stay overnight. They eat. They go to the, you know, their restaurants. They shop during the day because they stay Friday and Saturday night. You're getting a lot of business from there. Um, the committee, when I was on, we always welcomed new members, new volunteers. They could come at any meeting that they wanted to. We do just hit on some of the things that we're doing. I just want to mention that we do have top of the line entertainment now. They're national known acts, of course, the Vic Ferrari Band. Um, and this year, Boogie and the Yo Yo's are coming. They're um, another national known band. They just were asked to play for the Wisconsin Governor's Inaugural Ball. They didn't volunteer their services, they were asked to play there. Um, Last year, we did struggle with funding for the fireworks. And I know there were some articles in the paper looking for extra donations. A few individuals from the city came through for us, and the fire show display was presented for the city. Um, and you know, we've talked about that. Our donations were down. The, the canned donations and everything were down. And I hear that there are still problems with that. But we. I think the committee welcomes the new members, the younger members, new ideas. I think I felt after 10 years we needed new input and new ideas. It's always good for a change. Um, but we've had the gradual improvements over the years, bigger tents, the kids things, the stage, um, the, um, what I wanna say, the beanbag tournament. That's been going over good. And um, just the quality of your event. And so please do not reduce the funding for your Waverly Heritage Days. An increase would be much, much appreciated. And, you, and your funding would always go to awesome events. You know, you've been down there. You've seen it. You know what we can do. Um, the new kids' events are great. You need to keep the younger kids and the teenagers involved. And that's hard to do. So really, we would welcome your continued funding and any increase that you could see for us. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? Okay. Um, next up, I'll ask Hank to come up and represent the Waverly Area Veterans Post. Uh, there's a letter in your packets dated November 28th um, to the mayor and council uh, regarding a request to assist with uh, uh, a portion of their project. Well, good morning. I'm Hank Bogleman. I'm a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and I serve on the board of directors of the Waverly Area Veterans Post. In 2008, as a result of the flood, four independent veteran posts came together and began the journey to build a veteran service center in Waverly. From the beginning, we've had the continuing support of our city, its mayor, and the city council. Two years ago, in 2013, we requested the city's support by way of an initial contribution of $100,000 to be followed by five annual contributions of $50,000 each. The total request of $350,000 was less than 10% of the total project cost. We believed it was a reasonable request. $100,000 was contributed and the council left the door open for future considerations. There is no doubt that the council's financial contribution of $100,000 
coupled with the contribution from the Bremer County Board of Supervisors of $50,000 was the determining factor in our receiving a $675,000 CAT grant from the Vision Iowa Board. We know this because they told us. Our grant was the second Vision Iowa Board grant awarded to Waverly in 2014. The first award was to the Banshell Project. That's a total of over $750,000 coming back to Waverly for our investment. That's a pretty good return. Earlier this week, I received a letter from Lieutenant General Robert L. Caslin, the superintendent of the United States Military Academy at West Point. He said, Dear Mr. Bagelman, thank you for your letter of September 19, 2014, and for the information you provided to the Academy in regard to your Waverly Area Veterans Project. I will share the Waverly Area Veterans Project information and your website with my staff and faculty at the United States Military Academy so they can see how your project will benefit today's veterans and their families, not only in your county, but perhaps across the country. Again, thank you for letting us know about your project, Army Strong, sincerely. Well, once again, we're asking for your support. You have Daryl Blasberg's letter of November 28th before you. To date, you need to know that we have received $3,130,000 toward our goal of $3.6 million. That's 87%. What's more important is that more than 680 individual contributions have been received to date. 71% of those 680 contributions are gifts of less than $1,000. That, my friends, is an expression of grassroots support. Today, we're asking you to include an additional $50,000 of support from our city for the creation of the Waverly Area Veterans Service Center. 57% of our gifts have come from veterans and veteran families, and those veterans and their families have contributed 73% of the money received to date. When we Began the project, we identified naming opportunities within the building. The Technology Center is a place where veterans will learn computer skills, initiate job searches, conduct research on opportunities and benefits, begin their quest for higher education. It is also the site for interactive communications such as Skype, connecting veteran families here with a loved one anywhere in the world. We believe it may be something you wish to consider. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Hank. Well presented as usual. Thank you. OK. Uh, next up, we have a request from Helping Services for Northeast Iowa. Uh, they are a uh, family services program in the area. And I believe David Runyon is here to, oh, that's Northeast Iowa. Never mind. Sorry, other, other Northeast Iowa community actions. Uh, this request is for $2,000 for a grant. I don't believe that we've funded them in the past, uh, but it is a social uh, services program that benefits Waverly residents. So there's, that request is there. We also have Bremer County Community Partners and Joan Greenlee spoke to us at the um, uh, recent council meeting. They're requesting $100 for service this year for uh, primarily um, families and children in the Waverly and Bremer County area. Okay. Now we have Northeast Iowa Community Action Partnership, uh, Community Action Corporation uh, out of Decorah, and their request is based on a 75 percent, 75 cent per individual in Waverly, and now we have a speaker for them. <laughs> Morning, my name's David Boss. Uh, I'm the Director of Community Outreach and Development for Northeast Iowa Community Action Corporation. Uh, we have an office at 117 West Bremer here in Waverly, uh, also houses the Bremer County Food Pantry. We have a Head Start classroom up on Horton Road. Um, got some brochures here. If you're not aware, I'll try to just <coughs> keep one side. Should be enough there. We are a uh, 
We're a community action agency. We're one of 18 community action agencies in the state of Iowa, one of over 1,200 in the nation. Uh, my agency covers Allen McKee, Clayton, uh, Wintersheek, Fayette, Howard Chickasaw, and Bremer counties, the seven most northeastern Iowa counties. Uh, we have a lot of stuff under our umbrella. Uh, as the brochure goes around, you'll see we, uh, second thing on the list, of course, is public transit, which we don't provide in Bremer County or Chickasaw County, but we do public transit. Uh, right now, the big push that we're finishing up on is Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Starts every year October 1st and uh, runs through April. I was able to ask my fiscal department if they could tell me how many checks we've written to the city of Waverly in the last year. How much money have we paid back into on behalf of those that we serve, people with uh, utility disconnects, water disconnects. Um, just checks made out to the city of Waverly last year was uh, $20,814. Mm. Now in my database, I can't sort Waverly mailing addresses if they're in town or out of town. I wish I could, but I can't. For people with Waverly mailing addresses last year, we helped 270 households um, with 2,102 services for a total of $136,683. Now we never give money to a client. We give money to the landlord, we give money to the utility company, we might uh, pay for somebody to get a tooth extracted because your county general relief program helps people at a very, very low poverty level, very low, no assets, a lot of criteria you gotta meet. We look at different programs at different poverty levels. For example, for the energy assistance to low income, somebody that's 150% of poverty or below. For our crisis funds, local money that we receive donated to us within Bremer County, that stays in Bremer County, uh, we do 185% of the poverty level. Well, often what we refer to as a working poor. Households working, maybe three part-time jobs, no benefits, trying to make it, they run into roadblocks. Um, Head Start, up, in the, up here, we never have a problem filling our Head Start classroom. Um, we ask every incorporated town, city, within our seven counties, the same request. We ask for 75, 75 cents per capita for the residents. That's what we've asked from you. We ask for $7,405.50 based on 75 cents per resident based on the 2010 uh, Waverly population of 9,874 individuals. Um, this is what we've done for years and I don't believe we've ever received funding from the city of Waverly. We receive funding normally from all but seven of the incorporated towns, cities within our seven counties. Uh, really wasn't aware about the budget hearing never been here. We put in our letter, if you'd like us to show up, we sure would, but uh, I guess the, the burden actually is on those who are asking for funds to make sure there's an opportunity. Um, we've lost money, federal money, uh, that we use to keep our office open here. Uh, population up here in our seven counties has gone down. Our low income population based on the census has gone down. Therefore, we get less federal money to run our organization, even though we're a private nonprofit. So to maintain our office in Waverly, we in the past have asked Waverly Shell Rock United Way for funding to help keep staff going and help pay our rent there. Uh, I hate to keep asking the United Way to make it so that we can keep an office here. Uh, we'd like if the city of Waverly could help us there also. Um, we have offices open Monday through Friday um, two staff in there, that food pantry we operate is very busy. All the money that we get donated within the county, we don't take any administrative, no overhead, we don't use any of that for rent. It all is used strictly for food and for crisis assistance when somebody's got a utility disconnect, an empty LP tank, uh, eviction notice, things like that. Try to keep it under five minutes, I don't know if I did, but any questions? Anything you can give us is sure help. It's important work, thank you. Yeah. And earlier I mentioned uh, helping services from Northeast Iowa. Um, 
David Runyon, their office is actually across the street from us. They're a domestic violence uh, program, not, not what we do, different type of services. Thank you. Thank you. The other requests we have today, um, who who aren't be Travis is not able to be here today. They had to, they were kind of called out of town at last minute for a, a family issue. Um, but you'll see that the chamber request is the same as last year at, at forty five thousand um, dollars. Part of that is the city's membership, and part of that is our contribution to them to help with tourism, recreation, downtown activities, and the main street. Uh, I have had conversations with Travis, and we were talking about ways in the future for them to continue to grow their membership so that the city's contribution could be uh, even potentially decreased by a broader membership base in the future. Uh, also about that is we've moved uh, $14,000 for that request out of the general fund and into hotel motel tax, which is what hotel motel tax is designed to be for, is for that tourism and community attraction, uh, and instead put money into economic development, which we'll get to from TIF, which is an allowable use for growing, growth of the business space. So anyway, chamber request is flat this year at $45,000. The senior center has requested an increase from $7,500 last year to $10,000 this year um, for their services here. They're located uh, right over here by Quick Star East. I know Dan is the liaison to that group, so I don't know if you have any comments on their behalf or not. <coughs> Uh, not specifically on their crest, but uh, again, they do serve a very um, diverse population with some good programming, and uh, they have got a very good board right now that is very progressive in the way they look at things and the way they manage their funds, and um, part of what they focused on the last couple of years is just keeping the facility upgraded and um, hospitable to folks, I guess, when they come, so they enjoy it. And then again, we have community partners for $100 and helping services in Northeast Iowa for domestic violence for $2,000. Uh, in total, uh, new asks or changes this year are $70,005, $70, and 50000 of that would be to the Veterans Post, and the other 20000 and changes to these other groups. Uh, either who we haven't funded in the past or who are asking for a, an increase in contribution. So I think at this time, if there are any questions, uh, we'd take those. Otherwise, we'd just appreciate as staff some direction on what you would like funded and at what level makes sense so we can put it into the budget. With the Veterans Post, um, we could take that out of the same W fund that's just sitting there, not like last time. I mean, wouldn't it have? No, that's gone. So uh, the Veterans Post would probably come out of uh, that reserve fund. We used it. There was $150,000 in reserve, or 125, and it 150, and so it went to the 100. Where'd the 50 go? 50 was casualty. There you go. But you could use part of that backfill for that. It would just reduce that reserve amount. Yeah, because that's where we took the major contribution last time was from the W Reserve account where we had the cash balance. Right, so it was just sitting there, yeah. Yep, yep, and so that was a good one-time use of that yep. money. We, we don't have the W150 contribution anymore, that's gone. That's gone. To get the budget down, we use, for recreation, to get the budget down, we cut 100000 out of the budget and we move 50 over to the Fund 320 capital improvement for small projects. So that's where we do things like the crosswalk, um, upgrades to the library, kind of our $30,000 projects. And that, we'll get to that, that's funded through that $50,000 transfer and light and power contribution. So that's already built into the capital improvement fund. When upgrades to the library come out of the library fund? Not necessarily. If we do major capital, it comes out of the capital improvement fund rather than the operating fund. So would you like to continue funding at last year's request, meet new requests? <coughs> 
break it down and address each one of these and talk about them individually? Just trying to add up. The, what was the total for the? 70,000. 70,000 and five. Is this something we do today or could we do it at another time? We like to do it now to get the general direction because for the February 2nd meeting, we'll have be setting the public hearing on the tax levy rate at that time. So I think it probably plays in the whole budget maybe. You know, as we go through the budget process and see what we have. But I mean, it seems a little premature. Well, before you got here, we talked about, um, based on council direction last time, we used some of that backfill money. We had set aside about $106,000 of it to move the tax levy rate down to $14,0483, or $14.05, dropping it a dime. Um, so there is still $187,000 in that reserve stabilization fund. Um, and that's where some of the money for funding this could come from, or the, primarily the money for this would come from that fund. I guess maybe just a general background question. Has the city ever had kind of a human services department? I see a lot of these just kind of falling under social things and questioning. I, certainly they're all valid requests and, and groups that need the assistance. I'm just wondering if it really is something communities traditionally do is that human services and I don't know typically historically that's been um, part of the county budget counties were set up to run health and human services type things everything from the health department to care facilities and and uh, day programs and all that <coughs> as that's changed and as state and federal funding has changed it's become to, in my opinion it's become much more diffuse to private sponsors, public sponsors, pass through money and everything else. Uh, in some communities I've seen where they create like a human services board and the board will get an allocation of, you get X number of dollars and then the board will do this type of event. In the past here, it just seems like it's been council who's kind of decided, yeah, as part of the budget we do this, we're not gonna do that. But in some areas there will be a specific allocation saying the city has $50,000 this year to spend on this type of effort and then they can pre-budget talk about, or post even, knowing that the f dollar amount is flat. I guess that's running my background just because of uh, being part of United Way for six years and knowing how they approach their budgeting process or allocation process. And I guess I would hope if we're going to substantially increase our contributions in this area, we would look at some type of commission to help mm -hmm. screen some of that. And I think that's um, maybe what LCM too is. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe more of a, more of a equitable approach because there's probably others out there that probably wouldn't mind some funding and so forth. And Right. Um, yeah, because like on this list, you don't see Cedar Valley Friends of the Family. You don't see the Larrabee Center. You don't see some of these other local uh, or locally run communities. There's probably others that didn't know they had the opportunity this morning, maybe. Well, it's it's typically something, uh, again, that we haven't put out there saying, hey, we're taking all sorts of citizen requests and funding because I think there is a balance. And we talked a little bit about the resolution from 1999 that came out. And at that time, there was a lot of discussion in the city about should we or should we not fund private organizations or private nonprofits yeah. and to what where do you draw that line between this is something directly related to city service and, and revenues or it's not? You know, the, in general, most of these are just uh, adjustments or, or long-standing requests that we haven't funded in the past. The $50,000 is really the, the, for the Veterans Post is really the new, or, or not new, but revisited request. might suggest we do it individually. I know it's take some time unless someone has a wisdom statement uh, you know, otherwise to do it. The, the other, um, with that approach, if you generally know that what you want to fund will come from that reserve amount and not impact taxes, we can dial in specific dollar amounts later. The only problem is if we if we want to fund some of these, but we say, well, instead of cutting a dime out of the tax levy rate, let's only cut five cents or cut seven cents. Um, the whole thing about setting the public hearing is we can always reduce the levy rate after that, but we can't increase it. So essentially, we need to have some direction on how, if you want to pay for it, how do you want us to pay for it? 
because then that'll impact potentially the levy rate and that impacts the public hearing um, in February on the 16th. But going on nickels, only about 22,000. 22, yeah, because of growth in tax base and nickels, 22,000. I guess I'm just a little concerned that emotion may come into this because we do have this reserve fund to go into and if we didn't have that, would we address these requests a little bit differently? And I guess I would encourage us to not fund them just because we have a reserve, make sure that they have some long-term, what are we gonna do next year if we don't have the backfill money to use and those mm -hmm. type of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. kind of I guess I like your idea of maybe having commission to maybe take a more mm -hmm. uh, process approach to this. Do interviews and analysis and- Maybe you set aside a certain amount of the budget that people agree to and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm not opposed, I guess I just don't wanna leave anybody out or you know, it's like, well, gee, we, maybe we should ask for more, or maybe someone else could have asked for. It, it just seems like we're just kind of you know, show up and say, okay, yeah, let's do that. I, I'm not comfortable. I th I th yeah, I, I think also that that, that question from '99 mm -hmm. of just how we handle private uh, organizations, um, uh, the friends of the family and mm -hmm. Larrabee Center, etc., are dear to our hearts. But all, everything presented here was also put really important. The community action uh, effort partnership is, is obviously, it's just that it's new to us, but not new to the community and not less vital. But it does put us into a, in a, into a um, yeah, we've position. Had a number of requests in the past that we haven't funded for things. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's this, some of these requests are ones that we've had. People have asked us for things and we've not. Funded them. Right. So I don't know. I, I, it sounds like a very good study session topic to actually, you know, talk about the whole idea of the '99 discussion of how yeah. we contribute and how we how we oversee that and from from a from a standpoint. Um, and yeah, there's a couple. There's some new requests in here. I guess the one. New or, or request for an increase that I, I guess I would support at least a thousand dollar increase to the heritage days too since they're they're looking to add programming for that third day where we're, we're giving two thousand dollars right now for two days give them another thousand for that third day that they're planning and then we can look at what through the rest of the process for the other other two I don't think think that's on you know I guess none of these are unreasonable, but I mean, looking looking at though at, at what's in here, that's kind of the one that's kind of a, a new that's within the community that's been drawing people in and that we know of. Um, but the other is, I, I think, a process to go through and kind of evaluate. You know, the seventy-five cents per person is kind of an interesting number. How that comes out and and see whether that's where we want to contribute. If we want to contribute that, go to fifty cents per person. Go to some what the formula for that or for or any of these organizations that are doing good work within our community but it's it's a matter of where can we go and still I, I really like this idea of this contingency reserve fund that we're, we're setting aside just to, to help as we deal with the, the changes in the property tax laws and whether there's going to be backfill in the future or not and how we can adapt to that with it within our budget. And the changing landscape always of the social service agency world is something we have to keep an eye on, that the county was playing that huge role, uh, an oversight role of making sure we had uh, that side of life covered, um, that changes, and changes are, it's just that we're doing it kind of as we go here, um, but uh, uh, Pro Temp is saying that um, there are some here that are um, not precedent setting, and it's just uh, a simple, uh, quick look at the different uh, categories here. Um, let's stick with uh, Heritage Days a representation here, and you're suggesting they not only uh, receive their annual 2000 that we try to support them with, but you for adding an extra um, to that, uh, council discussion on that. I have a question still, general, uh, uh, general question. What is our goal for the uh, reserve stabilization fund? 
Well, that's a good question. Uh, right now, we staff just recommended maybe a 5% of general property tax receipts, um, but it can be anything council sets it at. Uh, the, where we are with that idea right now is really as an idea and budgeting some funding for it. Um, as far as specific language, and is it 5%, 10%, that would be a, a resolution that we would work on with the council. So uh, I think 5% you know, of, of where we are right now is around $250,000, and you could build up to that over time, or you could say, no, we only need 2.5% or, or 3%. So that's a, that's a policy decision. Um, because we have the general fund reserve that's kind of the granddaddy fund, um, I don't know that we need to be, I, I think 5% is a good target for the extra. But again, over time, not necessarily year right. one. Right, you, you could take three years to get up there. You know, next <clears> year <throat> is another backfill year that matches whatever growth we have in town. Um, so that's another opportunity to use some of it and, and bank the rest. And then in following years, if, if it stays in place after fiscal year 16, 17, um, or we have good years of, of controlled expenses and still growth in the tax base, those are times where we could build it up, say, over a targeted three or four or five year period. That whole process is so new and unpredictable. I'm not sure that I'd feel comfortable setting a precedent <coughs> for something the first year. And right. I, what I think from staff's point of view, it was, hey, here's an idea. What do you guys think about it? Um, we talked a lot about contingency planning. We talked about trying to also um, hold or, or decrease tax rates through growth. And so last week and this week, it's kind of, here's a way to do that that gets our foot in the door without locking us in or, or forcing us into anything in particular. And then I guess I have another question that has more to do with uh, uh, Heritage Days. <clears throat> um, what is common practice in, in, in other towns uh, in terms of not charging anything for anything? Is that, is that typical? I don't know. We don't, like we don't run our, we don't run, the city doesn't run this, so I mean, we don't have any control over that. Is what right, but I'm just wondering what, whether that's a common Edie, practice. Excuse me, Edie, the, the um, history of that is um, when we joined the committee, the idea that they had then was that not to charge anything, keep it f a free event for the community, um, so citizens would feel like they could come and they wouldn't feel inhibited if they, if they couldn't be there. Um, We've kept it that way. We've discussed the idea many times in meetings about charging for the va the bands or something, but then it comes down to the question, how do you regulate the people coming in? You know, we're, we're down at the fairgrounds. You, 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 we have fencing up, yes, but there are ways that people can get in, and how do you... How do you get everybody to pay $5 or something? Other towns that we know of are free. Other towns we know of charge something, yes. It's me. Like Sturgis is in Cedar Falls is free, mm -hmm. and I, but I don't know what the city contribution mm -hmm. is within that either. So I don't. Know. Yeah, yeah, you know. I, just to address that, I uh, based on the conversation last year, I made a few phone calls, and Cedar Falls does not get anything from their city entity. Uh, I had a contact in Japola. Their celebration doesn't get any contributions from the city, so. I think at least in the two person or two city poll I did, we're kind of a not liar there. That and this has any bearing, but Chipola is having a hard time finding somebody to do theirs this year. Yeah. They're they're really struggling right now to find somebody. We have been approached by um, the city of New Hampton to run theirs. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I didn't throw that out there. To <laughs> think you wanted to bite that off. <laughs> Pass that one up. Thank you. But <laughs> we were approached by the city of New Hampton <laughs> to run theirs. So. <laughs> <laughs> and like Chapula, because that's where I'm right. from. I mean, they don't have like a band. I mean, the local bar downtown has a band, but there's a cover. I mean, so they're they're not doing the same things. Right. You guys are having a free yeah, concert. Correct. Works. Correct. You're, yes, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, and you're. I mean, what you guys are asking for versus what what you're asking for is small compared to what you guys are spending. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's why I have no problem with um, your guys' uh, increased uh, request. I mean, I. I I have a problem granting that whole thing. I mean, I, I totally support that. Um, for what um, what you guys put on, I 
think is a again good, like minor request. The right. the I think one of the goals of the city is to be a destination place, mm -hmm. and we feel with the with our, the weekend that it is a destination place because we know we're getting people from out of state and all around Iowa. Yes. So. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that's that's awesome. kind of where I was going with the the adding, you know. Basically, we're funding $1,000 a day for the Friday, the Saturday that they're doing right now. We add another 1000 to this. What I was looking at, that extra 2000 maybe, you know, <coughs> or something, because what they said, the email they had yesterday was with the fireworks and how much they've decreased on that. That could go towards helping that offset, because that's a cost and an expense. So I don't have a, I don't have a problem with the, the request. It's, it's more you now looking at all of these things, and we have a lot of people requesting money it's how much do we contribute and how fast and you know I'm on the more conservative side of wanting to, to not just start spending money willy-nilly I would say I'm with Chris I mean I I've with the amount of money they spend what we're putting in is very minuscule of that but then the return on, on investment that we get out of heritage days is huge um, you know, having six, eight thousand people come to the weekend, spend money in Waverly, stay in Waverly. The city's gonna make that five thousand dollars back in one day, if not five full. I mean, so it seems like just a simple. We wouldn't have a parade without Heritage Days. We wouldn't have fireworks without Heritage Days. We wouldn't have you know all these great things. So to them to ask for three thousand dollars more. And then hopefully next year, you know, they don't have to because they've figured out some other fundraising. But and they are just not just adding one more day; they're adding much more activities to every day. So, I mean, you're, I understand your math of a thousand per day, but it's not really. They're adding activities to every day, so it makes sense to do it. President Check, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> I would. I would agree. Though. I think there's differences between us and Tripola and other towns, and it's probably it's your fault. You just have to kind of decide how we're going to handle it as a community. Yeah, I didn't make those comments to suggest that yeah. we needed to be in line with them. It's I think yeah. we we continually show partnerships across the community, and yeah. I think it's appropriate for the council to be part of this. And just again, uh, just general question on where these funds could come from. I mean, is this a hotel, motel, tourism? Could some of any additional come out of that funding stream? Some could, but I think um, as we've discussed in the past, we've moved. Uh, that fund has, and we'll get to that, that fund has uh, improved its net operations this year because we moved economic development funding out of there and chamber contribution in, which basically saved us a net of about uh, $26,000. So there could be some that comes from that. Um, Hotel, downtown hotel rebates don't start till next fiscal year. And we do want to be uh, careful to kind of see what the overall Im net impact of the hotel is. Uh, we think it'll be positive, but we also want to be cautious. So is there some um, funding available? Yes, but I would say a small, you know, a few thousand dollars, not several thousand dollars. I uh, thinking if we had agreement to go up to a $3,000 contribution if the other 1000 could come out of there. I think it could handle that. I always have to look for <laughs> the nod from the Don over there. <laughs> <laughs> for, for some of this discussion too today, just um, as maybe a possible solution, possible option, historically when it comes to health and social services, we've helped out with Sister City. We, I think, just celebrated 20 years last year, was it? Um, and historic preservation. We've uh, worked with the Senior Center and rec programming, the band and Heritage Days. So we haven't been doing helping um, services or Northeast Iowa. I think maybe as an option this year, we can talk about Heritage Days and Veterans Post um, and the Senior Center since they have been in there. And maybe for next year, starting in the spring, we could put together kind of a, a human concerns board who could then talk about what's a good funding level and then promote saying if the city's willing to set aside funding for the following budget year, they could promote taking applications and interviews and, and putting together criteria just to look for that. And that might be a way to kind of 
move into more of this uh, service area as we know the needs are there, but do it in a measured way. Yeah, so that right. way we can. I mean, I, I've been on a couple of, well, this is my third or I sat in on a fourth one, but Waverly traditionally has never given money to any of those things. So right. I'm not saying it wouldn't be nice to do that, but to just kind of all of a sudden do it without any guidance or a board or yeah. having other requests from local agencies. I mean, it just seems kind of would be awkward, I think. That could put more structure around it and give some time to do the yeah. advertising and, and get people who are aware of the services and the needs and all of that to evaluate and make some maybe recommendations to this group. And I guess I'm I would sure. like the term advertising because I'm not sure I want to advertising almost implies yeah. guaranteeing well, that yeah. we're going to give anything and <laughs> well I, I guess yeah. I guess maybe you know I, I just say that based on what Dave said which I think is a good point you see some names here but you don't see other right. other names who maybe would be here so and again I would encourage us to think about do we really want to put a superstructure in place that's already exists through United Way maybe yeah, our approach to it is to make a community donation to United Way and let them that's a great idea. Because they have a better pulse on what the community mm -hmm. needs, and they already have the process in place. To, uh, I would just hate to see us duplicate a lot of effort that's already there and something that goes very well. Hey, Dab, can you unlock that door, please? The way or the local Red Cross chapter will kind of yeah, that, that already that, that, dish out. I like that idea where if council basically says a level, then the United Way gets to use their process and their board to... Because I can see Thank you. the groups coming to us will be the same groups that are going through United Way. And why put them through two presentations? Why put them through two different? Sets yes, of yes, and no. I mean, some of them, yeah. not all or not everything goes through United Way. So, so, so how about for today? Maybe we just work on um, some of these, like Heritage Days, and then talk, discuss at maybe a February study session. I'm going to ask David. I, yeah. I just had a comment. Uh, I find it. Interesting, and I applaud you for not just doing something to get it off the agenda that you're having the discussion. Um, we work closely with Cedar Valley Friends of the Family. Uh, I'm, we're part of the Bremer County Partners. Uh, I'm on the Winnesheek United Way Board. It's kind of strange. I live in New Hampton, I work in Decorah, and I travel to seven counties, and I'm involved like with Owen United Way also. Um, your Waverly Shell Rock United Way here is an exemplary organization, great volunteer board. The only thing I wanted to say to you that you don't forget is as you appear to be deciding to set up some sort of review process, the one thing I would ask you to do is that when you decide to fund somebody with City of Waverly money, have some assurance that the money you give in to an organization is spent here. Uh, that's something we had to change with Winnesheek United Way. You have organizations that cover a large area, such as my organization covers seven counties. But the money I get from Winnesheek United Way is spent in Winnesheek County. The money I get from um, <coughs> City of Decorah, City Council, is spent on Decorah residents within the city limits. So that's the only thing I would suggest that you try to ensure is that Whatever funds you give to an agency are used in your city, not spread out for the agency to use wherever they choose. Thanks. Right. Which would differentiate between county and city. Thank you, David. Uh, we have, Phil, then the, well, do we have a consensus that we're going to look at the items that are, are part of this, year, this year's budget for next year? If we are, then we need to continue coaching our staff on where we're going to be with some of these figures. Are we, are we still on here? I mean, I'd I think still, we're still still looking at the yeah, ones that we Heritage have. Heritage Days yeah. is in play. Uh, I think Heritage Days, five thousand requests, makes perfect sense, and they seem to think next year they can drop back to a lower level. So, I think this would be a great way to get them bump started to have all those new activities since they are our town celebration. This makes sense to do it at $5,000. So, so far we've had the 3,000 figure thrown out. We've had up to 5,000 for 
Okay. That was their request, but it is, I mean, it's small, so it's yeah. not like they're asking for pay, us pay for the whole thing. So. Other input. And, th and that's, that's minimal, that's a minimal impact on the, on that. Mm -hmm. If we were to take it out of that reserve. <laughs> the, I guess the big chunk one then is the veterans post and what do we want to do with that? Um, if we were to, <coughs> we lower, you, you, you went in and you lowered the levy by t 10 cents right now. Mm -hmm. If we were to push that back up a nickel which is still lowering it a nickel from last year's. That would be about 20,000 and we could take 30,000 from this reserve fund. Yeah, I guess I'm a little disappointed that we moved the funds out of that into something else without, I mean. We did that as part of last year's budget when we did the $100,000. And actually I think we talked about it even when Bob was mayor from the W Guarantee Reserve, which is the $600,000 in TIF, is where that $100,000 came from. Yeah. Yeah, right, so the REC money programming was different. Yeah, but we had that so W was Reserve like 80, Fund, 000, right? that there was 180000 in it, and we paid the veterans $100,000 out of that, so there was still $80,000 in that fund. There That's might be. I requested to have it be 150 because we could just pull it right out of that fund and not change anything in the budget. So. There should still be about eighty thousand dollars in that W reserve fund just sitting there. But well, let's moved. look. Or, or part of this new budget is it was it was it had to have been us. moved with part of this budget if it's not yeah. no longer there. Is what I'm saying. We'll look here. <coughs> is that in capital improvement fund? No, no, it's a special revenue fund. Yeah, okay. special funds. I thought that fund, I thought the W Reserve Fund was set aside way at the very beginning because we didn't know we could pay it all out of TIF. So there was money set aside right. that was used a little bit at the very beginning, but then. Every year that's an so what are you saying? If, if we decide not to pay it all out of TIF for some reason, we'd have to give them somewhere else. Right. right. You know, but we haven't ever used that money because it was we were we have been able to pay it all out of TIF. The, the WWWR. So, so there, there is an eighty thousand dollar cash balance in the W fund still. Okay. Right. Okay. And the way we do that is that, so there we had one hundred eighty. We used a hundred out. So it's it's at eighty still. It's still there. But what it is is it's basically because it's subject to annual appropriation under TIF law, that's basically just a carrying figure in there. Now, you could you could use it knowing that there's probably enough TIF revenue there that you'll get the $600,000 you need in the future. You just wouldn't have any uh, cash balance. But that's also not an appropriate use of TIF because necessarily your money is in That's the other thing. You do have some restrictions on the dollars. But, but we took 100 it. out of it already we just for the same it. reason. And I think it... Oh, from the goodwill. There was an original transfer in, I think, of general use money. Okay, so that that's right. There was to, the seed money for the account wasn't tipped, and I don't know. Do you know how much it was? Yeah. So the seed money, and we were comfortable. I think at the time of the hundred thousand um, uh, dollar in the fourteen fifteen budget saying there was enough cash in that was general fund money that wasn't tipped that we could take a hundred thousand dollars out. Now the blurry line comes in, was it 150 that went in of seed money? Was it 180, was it 200, what was it? And then everything since has been TIF. So the other, the other thing you could do is there is, um, like we said, there's some of that reserve money. I think there is a balance in the Goodwill Fund, um, South Industrial Park Fund, which is not all TIF money. So that's $775,000 that money could come out of there. Um, because that's our economic development fund for future land purchase or whatever, but this ties to that without it having TIF restraints. So the 80 is still there, it hasn't been moved. The question is, if this was a TIF project, no problem. 
Yeah, well, we, we good to know, I guess. We can confidently say because this is a TIF. <laughs> and as Phil kept talking, I kept think, thinking, and I know the original amount that went in for this, for, for the W Reserve was from the Capital Improvement Fund, from the Recreation Capital Improvement Fund, which was probably, would probably cover that 50000 I would probably feel comfortable saying that there's at least 50000 in there that's not TIF. Okay. So you could use 50 out of the... I'm just saying that would be a way to give them their request and it would have zero impact on the tax. Mm -hmm. Net neutral. 40 been set aside years and years and years ago. As a reserve. As a reserve and not been ever used since. So, so that's a good funding source. And the one thing with the Veterans room. Post is that they do, or a certain portion of the building will be paying property taxes, so we will be getting that money back right. that we're giving them right, right now. And as a, as a regional draw and getting people in and all that, you know, we've talked about it as being a, a, an, a community attraction. It's or kind of like Heritage Days where 5000 we're going to get that money back pretty easily mm -hmm. with the Veterans Post. They're mm -hmm. also they're going to be paying property taxes, and they're going to draw people to town, so we're going to get that money back too. So those two, to me, even though we're paying it out, we're going to earn it right back. Yeah. It's a long-term investment. Yeah. <coughs> Is there a facility in a TIF district? No. Not that I'm aware. There's <coughs> nothing up there. It's residential. What's the um, <clears throat> what's the reason for deviating from the original plan? On the request okay. or the reserve? Mm -hmm. uh, no, on the on the request. I I don't know the whole history there. I know that their initial request was. It struck me that it was a hundred thousand dollars <coughs> kind of upfront, and then fifty thousand dollars a year for five years. Mm -hmm. And I believe that just over conversation and the success of fundraising, and I can't ask Hank because he's here. Maybe if, if uh, I talked to Hank last week, so I can tell you what he told me. But yeah, they asked originally. They looked around, and the city normally gives about ten percent as a rebate to like the hotel or to mm -hmm. um, all the other projects manufacturers industry 10 percent is the normal tax rebate that we give so they took their project which was about 3.5 million dollars at the time and asked for 10 percent of that which was a normal they thought a normal request that the city normally gives out to new projects so that was where their 350,000 came from in their original request but then the city decided to only give them 100,000 one-time money and so now that they're getting close they've just asking for so they're only asking for 150, where they originally asked for 10 percent, which would have been 350. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that second request is because I mean there, there was some interest from us to do, I mean, do do something yeah. more too. I mean otherwise they, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have um, wouldn't have asked. And and you know I support. I mean the, the 100 going up to 150 allows us, um, you know if they allow it to, um, we can earmark that to the technology center, yeah. which is. Which is was 100% uh, to helping veterans and their families. So it's it's not. Um, you know, we've had some some folks out in town say, "Hey, I'm okay with giving money to support veterans, but I, you know, I don't want. It, I don't think we should. The city should give money to you know the, the private part of it or, uh, or the commercial part of it. You know, if it could go towards veterans stuff, you know. So you know that kind of that kind of you know covers that too." And what happened to that um, discussion, and I think it's even in some minutes or some, maybe even in the resolution itself, don't recall for sure, about, I think that there was some money that was supposed to be dedicated to landscaping right, for the was, neighbors, because we have heard from them as well. Yeah, that was the 100000 and I think but the we discussion that. was basically that yeah, it got we removed. Really have yeah. to, we that don't really, part of the there's room. no real way to control that once it's. I mean, I don't very often do this, say that I represent a ward, but I think I need to in this case because this does sit in my ward. Uh, and I, again, how the council got to the 100,000 was because we allowed the process to work out, people to come in and share their concerns from the neighborhood, those type of things. And the balance that was struck was so that we could allocate some money to a very worthy project, but not so much that it started helping a private organization was to go at the $100,000 level and 
the stipulations of the screening and again to add some buffer to a residential area now again council changes what eventually got passed was an unrestricted donation and again I would just caution us to leap to a fifty thousand uh, dollar contribution without allowing the public to weigh in on it again and um, how is this again veterans are a very important part of our community but how is it different than uh, the women's shelter or some of those things it, it's still a civic group and again I would caution us not to jump too quickly too fast I guess and, and people still would be able to weigh in at the budget hearing <coughs> yeah. right and really it's only one resident that I'm aware of that's against any mm, of this there's there's you know I've been going to the hearings I all of them there's it's a number of people it's a whole little section two, of I mean, town it's, it's one and or we, two or three and we are, it's not very much in the mm -hmm. grand scheme of things. Well, there, no. there are, so there are only probably right about half a dozen on that street that would be directly affected, and I, I've heard from several of them. Yeah, I grew yeah. up on that they street. Hear, yeah. They hear, yeah. they communicate with me too. Yeah. But to Dan's point, we wouldn't have a women's shelter or any of these other functions without our veterans. We wouldn't have a Heritage Days without our veterans. We wouldn't have any of that stuff. So what's more, I mean, are, you, are we gonna cater to two or three people that are upset about a, a no, very no. nice, they already live next to an AMVETS with a gravel road. Yeah. They're gonna get a very nice yep. facility put built next to them. No, I think the issue was uh, that we want all this to be win, win, win. And so when the uh, wonderful new building is constructed, we want wonderful um, uh, landscaping will that will be. protect them. They've said yeah. they will, and, they will and, have I know. that. You know. One of the things that we, if I may, Mayor, one of the things we, we may do is, um, you can put, again, because we've found a way to fund it without impacting the tax rate, you could put a suggested amount in, or we can put a suggested amount in, and l let that be of note for the public hearing on February 16th, and we can mention it on February 2nd as we set the public hearing, as this is one of the discussion items. Yeah, it's, it'll be a chance for people to discuss that, and if as long as that 80 is still there, this is that's that was kind of my, my point when I made the motion for the additional 50 was that it would come, become part of the budget process for discussing that appropriation as opposed to the one time without really any notification to, to the public on how much we were going to do. Um, so so this, this is a, you know, it's there. It's not going to impact the tax rate. We let the public know that it's there. Same thing. And that pulls, that's the big chunk of what we're looking at here out of the 70. And if we set aside some of these other community ones, then it just, it, we're looking at the heritage days for up for 5,000, and we've got that within this reserve fund that we're, we're looking at without, again, without impacting the tax rate, we just draw down that. And the veterans money is actually coming out of a fund that was put there six or seven years ago, so it's not affecting anything taxpayers have recently paid. So it's, it's from taxes it's that were paid money. six or seven years ago. But I mean, it's, it's not any new money, it's not a new, yeah, but it's, I mean, it, it, it's 50 that we could spend on <coughs> other things, too. And we could, but literally. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I wanted to spend it on other things. I'm saying it could be, and, and citizens would As have Hank that As Hank suggested, they do have 150000 I believe, is their uh, line for getting naming rights to certain things. So well, 150 is the, the two sponsor the technology room. The so it could be so. the city of Waverly technology room inside the veterans. I mean, we could literally just sponsor the technology room and not have anything to do with any of the other banquets or any of the other stuff that people get concerned about with competition. We would just only sponsor the technology room that goes specifically to help veterans and their families. I guess I'm not too worried about the plaque. <laughs> well, I'm not either, but, if no, but, outside, but there, are, there are people outside, not, not the name, yeah, but outside that don't want to go towards but it's it's all it's all it's all know, the same project. It's all money that's going into the same big bucket. And, I and, agree, and, but if people get picky about we don't want to give money to a banquet hall, we can yep. we can definitely designate it yep. toward just the technology center, yeah. and that is strictly only used by veterans and their families. So. I think we're reaching some sort of consensus. You want to I'm draw things say, out a little bit, David? I, I kind of continue to go back to what Dan started. I think you know all these, um, and I. Be careful I'm not saying that I'm for or against any I'm all I'm for all of it um, but from a process and a budget standpoint you know, Dan had a very good point that 
I think we need to have a process around this so we're not um, acting on, you know, some might have passion for one area and some might have passion for another area. I'd kind of like to take that out of it and, and take more of a process approach like Dan proposed. I don't think we can do that today. I mean, I'm not comfortable with approving anything today. And, and I guess just kind of a process question as we went through the other departments, I mean, you know, we, we probably didn't um, say, well, I think we should have this kind of a truck instead of this kind of truck, or the library should have this kind of books as opposed to that kind of books. Do, do we want to do that with this section today? Sure, or it's yeah. kind of like we're being forced to a decision on this <coughs> where we haven't been forced to a decision on the other areas. Well, the, these, I, I guess, to answer that with, with the truck and some of those things, we're budgeting that money for, for that, and ultimately it will come back to us as to when they actually go to purchase the truck, when they when they put it out for bids, we'll actually approve like we have with the, the garbage trucks that we did. did. So this is we're giving organizations money, and we don't, once we give them the money, we don't really have much control beyond that. You know, we give Heritage Days $5,000, they've got $5,000 to, to spend. It's not like they're we're saying we want you to use you know green porta potties and not blue porta potties. But I think you know the better like you know some might say. Oh, we do. We don't know this, but someone might say, well, green, green maybe ones. we should give maybe we should give <laughs> fifty to the heritage days and five to the veterans, or you know we don't know that you know they're they're back there cheering, but we don't we, you know. And the, but I think that's my point is, and Dan is trying to wrap a process around it. I think we that's the direction I think we need to go. Well, I think we've taken your lead on that one a little bit because we're taking just the items that we have already um, um, and we're not actually budget. voting so on it still today. About yeah, it. and we're just <laughs> talking uh, suggestions to yeah. staff. Any more thoughts on suggestions to staff on any of the items that uh, uh, we have as part of our present budget and as it uh, reflected into next year's budget? I think I agree with. I agree with Dan and Dave on, on that process. I mean, I think that'd be great. I think the veterans one's a little weird because I think normally that would be done through a resolution like we did with the first one. Um, it's not something that's a continually asked for like Heritage Days or um, the Chamber, you know, continually asked for money every year. It's just a one-time contribution to help a one-time build of a building. So to me, that's something that probably should have been wrapped up back in November, but it got pushed to this. Um, and that probably isn't the normal, this isn't, that isn't really a normal request we get to say, hey, help us build a building as a request. And usually the requests are ongoing funds that they need to help with their ongoing operations. And so the, the VETS kind of stands out different from that, but they were forced into this position as part of that. So. Right, as we have a little bit of money that we can actually look to, which we weren't 100% sure of until we've evolved this far. So we congratulate the staff for bringing us this far that we can have some sort of discussion that has some sort of budget potential to meet. Um, I ask one more time, any more thoughts on any of the budgeted items and the requests that have been br well, the other, brought the other, to us? The other request that was there was the senior center was requesting an increase. Again, which, I mean, I'm just, Looking at the ones that have been previously budgeted, the senior center has been previously mm -hmm. budgeted and they were looking for an increase. And so it would be kind of a give the staff direction on right. do we want to go the go the another twenty five hundred for them and up to ten or I mean they were at five two years ago, three years ago, and they went up to seventy five two years ago and the last two years have been there. So do we do we go Dan a little input on as the as the liaison on that? Can you help us with that a little bit? Again, I haven't stayed as close to the group as I probably should have because of the increase, because they do have such a strong board. But I guess I would suggest maybe delaying any increase out a couple more years. Uh, again, they're, they've got great programming there, and they've, they've done great things to improve the facility. But again, where, what is our role in social services, I guess? So I don't want to see us grow that until we've had that conversation. And What's their overall budget? To be honest, I haven't seen their recent one, so. You know, that's again. We're talking also about, you know, maybe we can change the, the levy a dime, but then it goes up a nickel and it comes down seven cents. I mean, I, I'd like to take a buck out of the levy or two. 
you know, so I mean, that's, I mean, that'd be my direction is not talk about nickels, but talk about something that can actually impact people. So, and I think, you know, what Dan is saying might lend to that. Uh, I guess I think the mayor's trying to help us along here, knowing that we've got a lot more to go through here. Do we need yeah. some motions and actions on just a general consensus? Heritage or I'm just wondering without an actual motion if we're going to get consensus because I've heard a 3,000 and a 5,000. I've heard 50,000, nothing, and I don't know. No, my, my, my on a three, again, I'm being cautious on it, but with, with willing to discuss it. But part of that was looking at that 50 in there and where that was going to possibly come from, too. And it, it seems like we've kind of come up where we have that in another location for that, which makes it easier without drawing down that reserve fund. Again, we're talking generally on any of the requests that are coming in that are already part of the budget. Um, Councilman Gay, do you want to? Would you Would you like us to vote on some stuff or no? No, it's just uh, just general no, yeah, for open input. Laws, but I, I, I think we all need to, oh, okay, to sure. weigh in any suggestions. And yeah. It's very helpful on I, the. I, mean, uh, we, I think we have broad direction enough. I know where I stand. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's Maybe, already weighed in. Yeah. How about if we go around and say yay yeah, or nay? Yeah, yeah. So, how, how about just tell me where you are on Heritage Days and the Veterans Post, just in general? I guess I'll start. And I would, my position would be to increase the Heritage Days to three thousand and not fund the request for the Veterans Post at this time. I guess I wouldn't. I'm just all the discussion. I'm not comfortable today making any decisions on anything until we have a process in place that's equitable across the community so that's no on both not that you're voting but just you I'm, want just a process you prefer a process no to anyone okay. specifically but I, I we need to put a, a process around this so we're equitable to everyone okay okay yeah. I'm, I'm fine with going to the five with heritage days and since the veterans post is coming out of a, a different spot that's fine keeping the senior center and having the other ones be put into a come up with a process for same. Okay. Yeah. I don't feel strongly about the three or five. It's for the for the heritage days um, because of the small amount. On the other hand, it's a hundred fifty percent increase. So, you know, I just kind of wonder, you know, what 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 the prompt was for that. And I, there were there were some good explanations, um, uh, but I wonder whether those won't. If there's decreased funding now, whether we won't be facing this every year, contrary to what Wes thinks might happen, that you'll de you'll come back with a smaller request next year. But not a big deal. I could go either way on that. Um, I, I don't have a lot of clarity on the uh, on the. I, I'm supportive of the uh, the veteran veterans project, um, and I I just don't have a lot of clarity on why we need to move on this now and what we gain from it and what we give up by doing it. What other potential um, uses you know, for those funds would there be? So I guess I, I'm not necessarily opposed to it, but I feel like I need more information. Okay, that's helpful. Councilman Gay. I'm yes to both, and mm -hmm. the Veterans Post needs the money so they can construct their building, otherwise they have to take a loan out for the remaining. And so we would be saving them lots of money without having to take out a loan. So, okay. so it makes perfect sense. Okay, thank you. Um, and the I, money's already in our budget, so it won't raise taxes one cent. And, and procedurally, what we can do is we can just from what I've heard today, we can move from 2,000 to 5,000 for heritage days using backfill funds for that 3,000. While what we're talking about today is we're talking about budgeting dollars. So like for the Veterans Post, we can budget that in that line item of $50,000. But as you'll recall from last time, it still takes a council resolution to then basically approve the funding and approve the check request. So what we're talking about now is just kind of to Edie's point is we're gonna earmark it we're going to put it in there, but it still takes council discussion and action to actually give the money. That's one thing I would caution. Like when you said you can't go up, but you can go down. Right. I would caution you to put in the 50000 because we do have a new council person that will be sitting and will be voting yeah. on these things, and that could change the way right. the resolutions vote. And I, wouldn't, I, would, I would rather have it be in there so that maybe we do decrease it, and that's right. fine. But if we're not allowed to increase it, that would be a problem. Well, and, and that's the levy rate, 
overall, and if this is in there, we'll, we're going right. to And the show veterans' a money is coming out of something that wouldn't affect right. the levy rate right. at all. So, right. yes. Yep. So, but, but I, I hear you on that yes. other stuff, too. Okay. So we'll do that. Senior Center holds the rest of these. We'll uh, begin working on a process to do uh, review and evaluation and, and uh, kind of a decision-making model for other types of funding. I think the, before we even get into a process, I think what we'll do is we'll bring it forward to a study session to get direction on should we be in this business or not? Because I think that's the first question to answer before we look at how to evaluate it, should we evaluate it? Okay. Now we're going to get pick right back up with economic development. Um, I'll ask Bill to come up for his area. And uh, what you'll see this year in the budgets, they're different uh, after our streamlining of departments from last year with economic development, community development, and legal. Good morning. For the public, this is Bill Werger. I'm the uh, community development director, economic development director, and city attorney um, based on last year's sort of reorganization. Um, in the previous year, the budget process actually had a, an economic develop, development department that had two uh, full-time individuals. Uh, the community development department had a full-time and a part-time staff, and the city attorney was a uh, part-time position. So we, it, the, all these were combined, and really what we have is two budgets that are I, I consider one, the community and economic development department because we all are in the same office together. Um, there's so much overlap, that's why we uh, intended to do it this way, that we had one director over both, um, one that had knowledge in both areas, and so I think that's, uh, I consider my, my staff to be four-person staff, um, <clears throat> with me as director. Uh, Connie is now the uh, economic development specialist, and Ben is the planning and zoning specialist. I think that really focuses um, their efforts on their areas and my efforts on all areas. Um, we did end up with a full-time office manager. Uh, Paige Robertson was, was hired and she is allocated uh, among three budgets now. Um, we've got her allocated one-third to the economic development budget, one-third to the development budget, and one-third to legal and legislative. Um, it, she's been very valuable uh, during the last uh, six, seven months with uh, helping me with uh, uh, conveyance documents, um, acquiring property. Um, she's really been busy in the city attorney area. Um, I, that'll continue while we're doing projects and land acquisitions. Might be a less when we're not doing as much acquisition uh, work. Um, but she also has been very busy in the uh, community development area. Um, a, as I have, um, drafting the rental code ordinance, uh, meeting with landlords, uh, really working that process through. Um, they are now setting up, between Ben and, and Paige, they're setting up uh, the, the, the process for, for registering and administering that code. It's quite an endeavor with the spreadsheets and the, and the databases we're, we're compiling. Um, so it's, uh, we think right now our, our, our employee level is, is uh, where it should be. We have a strong emphasis on our economic development area. Um, I'm providing help and, and uh, backing to uh, uh, Ben in his area with his planning and zoning. And uh, the city attorney job bring, being brought in-house, I think, has probably provided more benefits uh, in that area among all departments. I know I'm getting a lot more requests for help and assistance. Um, advice, um, and I think that's not never a bad thing for a community to, to be careful and, and to uh, be sure on the on the things they're doing in the in the legal areas. So I think that's worked out to be a real benefit. Um, looking at the budgets, um, let's look at the economic development budget first. <clears throat> in order to kind of make this work this year, as far as how we did the numbers, I've tried to allocate the actual time spent in each area. It's not going to be perfect, and it's going to be a changing thing over the year, depending upon what you're doing. But in economic development, I consider myself a half-time um, person, although it sometimes feels like it's a lot more than that. Um, but the, the, you'll note that that also includes one-third of, of Paige's salary and then uh, the full salary for, um, for Connie. Then you look at the community development budget. The personnel costs are considered to be 20% uh, for me, 100% for Ben, and again, a third 
for Page, and then in the leg, uh, legal and legislative, my uh, salary is 30% in that budget, and Page's is one third in that budget. Mm -hmm. So looking at the economic development budget, let's go back to that. I'm sorry, kind of all over the place on the here. I know I am. <laughs> We have uh, the, the personnel costs then are, are set by the percentages I just set forth. The, the actual um, services and commodities, I guess that the large, some of the largest ones are the dues and, and memberships. Um, that includes the regional uh, partnership that we belong to that we contribute $2,600 to. Can I jump in uh, just a second on, sure. on that but as you were doing the salaries and, and where that yep. comes from? Because you've got under personnel on the last page, um, the office assistant is 0.5 for the economic development, 0.5 under the community planning uh, zoning. Nothing under the legislature. And you just said that they were third, third, third. She was divided third, third, third. Is there, is there a way to get that put in the notes for when we get the actual budget? Which notes yes. are we talking? I think accurately just reflected. And, oh. yeah. We yeah. can do that. We'll just get that updated. Okay. Just. Okay. For on the final, or we'll get you a revised sheets okay. for these three areas. Because that's what the numbers it, are. I think it reflects in the dollars. It just doesn't reflect in the yeah. I just count. Make sure we have and that. On that employee list sheet, mm -hmm. the, which is part of your the four sheets that you have in the in, right. It's divided up there. Okay. We just I'll change in the it. box. The other expenses under economic development, uh, we're going to be going through a process. We're already spending a lot of time with the, the website, and we're going to be retooling a lot of our um, uh, our brochures, pamphlets, that kind of thing, rebranding, um, kind of changing the focus from being a uh, regional uh, group to being a, a, a city. We, we, can sit, we still consider it the waiver of the area. Um, we look to the area generally around us um, as being part of our, our uh, area to, to focus on, but I, I think in our um, past uh, brochures, pamphlets, um, website descriptions, it, it was sort of a, um, a, a difficult thing to say, the Waverly area, and it, it was sort of meaning Bremer County, but it, it didn't really work very well in the way it was described, and so we're, we're going back to fo focusing on Waverly and the surrounding area, um, knowing that we mean the, the area generally around us. And that doesn't mean that economic development is not going to help uh, our, our partners within the, the area, the community, the county. Um, if, if asked, I will give help to anybody who asks us for it. Uh, I think that's part of being a part of a region. And so that focuses, again, on that regional partnership. And I wanted to point that out, that $2,600 that we spend there. I think that's probably the best value we get out of the whole budget. That $2,600 buys us a lot of marketing um, uh, strength from that group, that regional partnership is a six county area. Um, we do a lot of regional um, uh, uh, traveling and the expenses that w with one of our staff, either Connie or I go on those trips, it's all paid for by that partnership. So that $2,600 sometimes means two or three, maybe four um, tra traveling trips to, to see uh, site selectors and, and different companies. And so I think that's a very good value for us. Plus we get marketing materials from them and we have regional people who are looking for leads and giving us leads on regional uh, uh, requests for information. So uh, the, the rest of that budget, I'm still working through it for, for the, the coming year in the sense of knowing how much we're gonna spend. My, my thought is that we probably uh, may not spend everything and we can probably retool this a little bit next year, but those numbers aren't gonna be very big when you're talking about any changes that might be made for next year. So it might be a couple thousand bucks. Um, the, the second page of that economic development budget shows the, the partnership contributions. Um, Waverly Light and Power obviously is a very important contribution to this, to our efforts. Um, we still have received in the past the health center contribution. Um, the, the private contribution I believe is from the energy company. Um, I don't know if we are we haven't gotten that yet this year, but I. Where did he? I think, and also Mid -American. I, think, I think Walmart did some too. So. Yeah, it, I would like to. Meridian. Meridian. I would like to do some of that. It, the, the The problem I have right now is that we are part of the Greater Cedar Valley Alliance and Chamber, and that is a membership organization. 
Um, we have 14 or 15, I believe, of our industry and businesses that belong to that and are solicited to give um, membership money to that. They also get solicited for memberships in the uh, chamber locally. So it, it becomes a, a little bit of a difficult sell if I'm, a, if I'm a city department to actually go out and solicit funds to just, just to supplement the, the, the budget. Um, there may be times when we're gonna solicit funds for s particular projects. If we do a job fair, if we do um, a specific economic development type uh, effort that's gonna benefit uh, certain businesses, we may ask them to help with the cost, and I'm, th I'm sure they'll be glad to do that in those situations. So I, I, stu I still think that there's some ability to gather, gather some funds to offset some of our um, expenses, and we can do that when, when we can. Um, but beyond that, uh, that's the way the, the budget is for economic development. Does anyone have any questions for that budget? Uh, you mentioned the Greater Cedar Valley Alliance. Yes. I've read a few places and had some talks with some people um, that they're kind of concerned that every time that organization speaks, they really only talk about Cedar Falls and Waterloo and don't ever mention Waverly. Has there any been concern about maybe not being part of that or trying to stress to them the importance that we are a member and that they need to mention Waverly yeah. in all their... Sure. Uh, communications and stuff. I've got a good, I've, I've got a good response, I guess, to that because I think in the past I don't know how much we've we've involved ourselves in, in that group with that group. Um, we went to a uh, go. alliance uh, legislative. But it, you're on the board, and I know no. you participate. But as far as our staff, um, I went to a legislative meetings with uh, legislators, and and I'm going to try to attend a lot of those alliance. And they were surprised to see us. And well, but they were ha very happy to see us. And I think the more we involve ourselves with that group, the more benefit we'll get out of that group. Um, I believe there's going to be a, a nice presentation with one of our local industries um, uh, being honored as the Cedar Valley uh, Business of the Year. Um, and that's coming up at their banquet in March. And so I think that's a great recognition. And that's a good segue for us to get involved a lot more in that Alliance and Chamber. And I don't want to give up on it because we haven't been involved as much or been, been, as, been as active as we need to be. And so we'd like to really make the effort. And we did make a commitment to do a five-year commitment for that $5,000 a year. And this will be our third year of that. So I think we can evaluate it maybe at the end of that five years to see where we're at and what happens in the next two years, next three years. I think people in the They're valley are still waiting for five years because I've heard the same thing. Wes says I want to make sure we are making sure we get our bang for our buck return our investment as I, Wes had said. I think there's a lot of internal discussion on just is it you know trying to combine the Cedar Falls Chamber and the Waterloo Chamber and we've seen a little bit of that fallout just with the Northeast Iowa Community Foundation and that whole debate so I think Bill's taking the right track right now about getting more involved at the staff level and regularly uh, so then we have something to base it on in the future. Um, the other thing is uh, just we're all struggling with, like Bill mentioned a few minutes ago in his comments, regionalism versus looking out for number one. Yeah, and I right. think that no, even peop, even though we've been kind of singing the the regional hymn book for a long time, people still aren't sure how to make that work, and they're still, and they're still afraid about us at the end of the day. What's what's it going to be like here at home? Yeah. So I think Bill's approach is a good one for now. The the, the chamber did the Alliance and Chamber did uh, hire a staff member who was formerly in a position with one of our counties. And he has tried to bridge that gap now to, to make it more relevant for the people that are not just in Waterloo or Cedar Falls. So I think those efforts have been good because he's worked with us on the, the uh, um, software that we purchased to, to help monitor our, our industries and business and make it a regional database. So that helps all of us. I, I think it's a wait and see. I may come back next year and tell you I don't want to do it. So we'll, we'll just see what happens. Yeah, right? I just brought it up because I've heard concerns that sure. people you know, they don't seem to mention Waverly when right. they mention that so what's group. So yep. it'd be nice if they'd mention yep. Waverly as part of the Cedar Valley. Alliance. Let's hope in yeah. March when they have the big gala, the, the big uh, awards, that'll be a big that'll boost for us. Yeah, so you're right. but that anyway. was just one concern. I sure. I guess I'm curious before you, before you go on, as sure. I add up the economic development budget, the community development and zoning budget, and the legislative legal budget, um, the employee costs between those three actually, as projected, go up about 12% from the previous year. Um, so the so the total budget, is, um, just between the, the first couple, is close to 400,000. I guess I'm curious, how do you how do you measure within the economic development and the 
community development, how do you measure um, success or so? So for spending five hundred thousand dollars, how do you measure the bang for the buck from that? You know, as I'm, I'm kind of thinking back to, uh, um, you know, with our um, our review with our the consultant that was talking about our debt levy and a lot of that uh, our debt capacity is based on community growth and so forth, and they're trying to project that as we're spending five hundred thousand dollars on economic development and so forth. I'd, uh, what do you do to uh, understand how that's going to move the needle on growth in Waverly? Yeah, and, and I, I, some of that's economic development, which is or uh, community development, which is planning and zoning and board of adjustments and those kinds of things, which is about a fifth of that or a, a twenty percent of that budget. Um, I, I don't know how to tell you that because I know that I how many things I'm working on. I know how many things that that you explore and that you work at. And and what I'm understanding in the area of economic development is you. You might have 10, op, uh, 10 opportunities and chances and uh, things that you pursue, and you may be lucky and just jump up and down if you get one of them. Um, if that one's a big one, then you really jump up and down. Um, I, I hope we're influencing things like planning decisions, how we develop our community, where the areas of need are in terms of not just industry and business, but housing, um, uh, infill, connectivity, uh, we're trying to do it as a broad-based planning, planning uh, mechanism, and we're trying to use things like the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, our Economic Development Commission, to give us guidance and give us uh, direction about how to do things. Um, we try to influence uh, things subtly that, that really can't be measured when you're talking about helping uh, people locate, find uh, areas to develop in, um, maybe even sort of helping people rearrange their, their plans maybe focusing them in a different area that makes more efficient use for them and for the city. Um, there's a lot of those things that, that are really hard to measure. Um, I can tell you that, that I'm hoping that at the end of next year, I'll be able to come in and say, these are the things that we accomplished. These are the things that we got, that we got done for the, the community. These are the things that, that are happening because of some of our efforts. Um, you know, I don't know how many they'll, they'll will come through. Um, that's not always our control because we're not a uh, funded corporation that can really provide stimulation. If we were an economic development corporation, we could use funds. We could, we could actually get involved in, in doing some of these business deals um, ourselves or at least spearheading those efforts. We're a department that helps facilitate things. We, we can provide incentives. We can secure incentives from the state or help with that. Um, I've been doing that recently. Uh, I've gotten to know Debbie Durham on the phone. Um, and, it, and it's really one of those things where you, when you're fighting for certain things for your community and for your, your businesses, it, it takes time for those things to pay off. And they don't always pay off all at once. Um, we're hoping that that will happen in the next year. So I, I can't tell you, except I can just try to keep track of what kind of efforts we've made, what, where we've been involved, and, and share that generally with you. Some of those things I can't say in public because we don't have the uh, yeah. ability. I wonder if that's something we can do in the future. You know, sure. If you look at, you know, we, we got a presentation on um, you know, new garbage trucks. They know if they get this kind of a truck, this is the efficiencies that's going to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be, um, it wouldn't be out of question to, to have an understanding or at least what your goals are for economic development. You might, always, might not always meet them or whatever and might have to make adjustments, but I guess I'd like to see that going forward. I guess, I don't know if you, if you can comment briefly, and, and maybe my math is wrong, but on the 12% increase in... Yeah, the 12% increase has generally been, because I, I think between the director's salary and the city attorney's salary from last year, that should be a wash with me, yeah, because it, be, if you added the, the salary from the director from last year and the salary I was getting as a, uh, as a part-time employee, I think that covers my salary. If, if you look at, um, I think Connie received a, an upgrade in her... Yeah, one one step or something. One like that. step, and and then uh, um, just and then the 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 office manager. That's the that's probably a, a right. fairly substantial increase half there. Full half time to a full time office manager because right. she's basically taking care of three areas, and I think that's where the biggest increase is right there. The other thing is we actually had savings in various projects because Bill would be billing us hourly for all of the work on airport dry run property acquisition, um, jonky issues, things that weren't covered by insurance that are now just part of the regular 40 hour a week work week, which is why we split it up as a regular salary over certain areas. But I guess, but as I add them all up, that you know, we don't have savings, it goes up. 
not in your not in your personnel line, but you will in other pro specific project accounts, and you will in um, contractual. I think was the other the other yeah, yeah included in contractual. So, so maybe, maybe something to look at. I guess because yeah. I tried to include all that. Okay. I'm just curious because we've always talked about how this would, and I, I agree with the strategy. I think it's a, a great strategy to have the director and so forth. I was just curious on that. Yeah. And I think having targets and goals. That's uh, oftentimes. Those are all included in the annual reports, but I think now with the new Economic Development Commission and the review of those priorities, that's a good time to say, what's our focus and how will we measure it? Yeah. And, well, and what our, are the metrics? I mean, I guess, what are the, what are the things that you want to be looking at that will be indicators of success? Yeah, we've, had, we've had some emails, email you know, debates on, like is you know, people growth or is it assessment growth or is, you know, be, right. to, we need to know what our goal is. Right. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to look at increasing in, uh, Housing starts, mm -hmm. because one of my goals has been to, yeah. is to uh, generate some uh, some additional subdivision growth, yeah. um, lots available. Um, we're working on that. We've, we're actively involved in that. So I'm hoping hoping so that be, will happen. Yeah. So as part of the planning, it'd be good to say, hey, we want, you know, we've been doing whatever the number is today, 20 or 30, and we want to grow to 50, and then we decide if that's the right thing for Waverly. But then how do we get to 50, or whatever? You know, that's right. just one area of all the sure. areas you're working on. Yep. Yeah, and, and I, I guess getting my feet wet now for the last six, seven months, I, I'm kind of envisioning how I can do that for next year a little bit more um, uh, sub, uh, objectively instead of subjectively. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, our, our objectives are pretty much sort of subjective. The idea of we want to increase growth, right. we want to be... Uh, we, Grow, get better. Yeah, yeah we, we want to be better. Right. And, and we what's, also, what's the right we also have an, what happens and I think for next year, it. I think we can look at housing starts. You know, can we increase it by 20? Can we, can we increase it by 25? Well, right. that kind of thing. my job, I hear a lot, we want it nicer. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we have to quantify that. Right. And so That's we right. know what that means and when we've met and how much money it's going to take. Yep. Yep. We also have a very strong Economic Development Commission that's giving us a lot of um, focus on, uh, on, on efforts, and, uh, which is really exciting. And I can just say, uh, just to knowing uh, what Bill's uh, workload is and efforts that... Uh, um, uh, his uh, remark that will be you know, looks forward to coming back in, in a year and saying here's what I was working on can't talk about it all right now but uh, and you no, never know till the end on, on whether something's going to happen but the immense effort uh, that you are putting into so many different projects as we emphasize our growth potential is uh, is exciting to watch and I'm excited about the Commission uh, also giving focus and it's just when you when you have that kind of energy being put forth you realize why communities put planning economic planning as the uh, uh, there's no higher there's no higher uh, department than than that our future will depend on a lot of what Bill's doing so keep it up thank you I, I, I want to address the um, issue of, of how we would reduce our budgets um, and Obviously, since our personnel costs are, are the vast majority of our budget, if you're talking about, I look at our total budget as being about 345, and that the legal budget is really one we'd have if I wasn't here anyway. So that's kind of a different consideration. Um, but even with that, if we've reorganized so that we have a specialist focusing on planning and zoning, we have a specialist focusing on economic development, and we have uh, myself being the city attorney and supporting all those areas and overseeing those areas. And then we have one administrative staff person, which is basically serving all of those three areas, which is quite significant this year, especially with the addition of the rental code uh, administration. Um, already, um, the other thing Paige has done is she's already taken over as one of the key people in our staff that knows how to use this new website and know how to, knows how to do things. And she's already helping to train others. Um, she is, is really uh, doing a lot of support for three people and even more when it comes to the website. So when you talk about personnel costs, you can't just say, well, we'd have to get rid of one per position. You'd have to really just reorganize what, how you're doing things. And that would be something that if we had to do it, if it was a, uh, a calamity and a, and a shortfall of, of great proportion that said, we have to all cut, we can't do anything about that, we would look at first reducing salaries um, or, or furloughs of that, uh, if it was a temporary type of thing. And then beyond that, if we had to go consistently 
um, at, a, at a less budget, 10% less budget, we'd look at reorganizing and probably reducing some staff because um, we'd just have to do that. We'd have to reorganize that way if we were going to reduce substantially. Otherwise, I'm hoping next year that I have a better feel for, since I've been through this budget process and then I'm going to be through this budget year, then I'll be able to be a lot more um, specific on the types of things we can project for next year. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll move right into legislative and legal, executive admin, move through finance and take a break. I'm just looking at the clock and it's already a quarter till 11. Um, so I'm thinking that uh, we need to either add some time later today or maybe tack it to the study session Monday um, because I don't know that we'll make it through all of this by noon. I tried, Wes. I tried. <laughs> Okay, legislative and legal, this is really, uh, again, um, kind of the account for things that really fall under city council, like some of the attorney work, um, uh, dues and memberships to things like the Iowa League of Cities, uh, travel and conference for the council and mayor, um, advertising, uh, things like our minutes, that's quite a, a chunk of money. Um, and then we have election contracts come out of here. We'll ha be having a regular election in November, which is about $10,000. Um, consultant professional fees. In the past, we've had a uh, facilitator for goal setting, and, and we uh, added a little bit of money back to 2013-14 levels there, um, knowing that we will take a different direction this fall. Uh, overall, there's a slight increase, and again, that's because of 30% of the attorney and part of the admin costs there. And you can see that that budget gets um, uh, allocated a little bit to water, a little bit to sewer, and a little bit to solid waste. I haven't zoomed in very well here. And that's, again, just a standard practice here in the city because of the overhead for those uh, enterprise funds. In executive admin, that's uh, the budget for uh, Carla and Val and me. Um, we'll go through that really quick. Our focus is really, uh, we are kind of the, um, what we'd call the day-to-day -day management of the city and the support for the, the governing board or the mayor and council. So our focus is implementing those strategic priorities and goals and keeping, keeping things going. And I think Carla and Val do a better job of that than I do. Um, I just look at them and say, no, I'm just kidding. They're great. Uh, we have reduced our budget here uh, because we have um, uh, saved in workers' comp and group insurance. So that's seen an overall decrease in uh, personnel services. We have um, added money to the travel and conference line item because this year with our change with uh, promoting Carla and adding Val, they'll need to attend the Iowa League of Cities uh, Municipal Leadership Academy and the Municipal Clerks Institute. So those are throughout the year, and those help them get their certifications that are suggested under the Iowa League and state code. Uh, there's a little bit of um, uh, savings in telephones because we've changed our cell phone policy from city-provided devices. We now will still provide a device if needed, but we've moved to a reimbursement program where you can be reimbursed on your own line for a portion of that for city business, uh, which has saved some money there and moved some of those expenses out. Uh, to various departments. Um, employee recognition, we cut that by $150. Uh, we've lowered the office equipment amount from $7,000 to $2,500, just since we're not anticipating large purchases. Um, and so overall, when we look at the bottom line, we've uh, tried to cut that back by a little over 6%. Again, our area is um, uh, essentially all salaries. Um, some of the areas that we could cut back for our 10% would increase, uh, would be uh, reducing our minutes publications. We spend a lot on minutes because we try to publish, not quite verbatim, but we try to get the essence of every discussion item. And really the only requirements of the item was discussed and the vote that passed. And so um, we could still be in legal compliance, but cut that back quite a bit. Uh, we'd also uh, cut out employee recognition and training, uh, travel and conference. Uh, we would reduce some personal service line items, and we have an intern in executive admin that's budgeted that we would cut out. And those kind of, we, we operate those two budgets together. That's why I'm just covering them now, because they really are pretty symbiotic. 
Any questions on our areas? Not much change. Thank you. I didn't even have to ask. <laughs> Uh, we'll get into the accounting budget, which also covers a lot of different areas. It, it uh, covers the utility billing portion, meter reading, accounts receivable, accounts payable. Uh, we kind of oversee the uh, city servers. Um, we have the audit, we do the budget, and uh, oversee all the finances of the city. So that's all included in this. Um, not much has changed. I'm not going to go through every line item. Um, we uh, part of the uh, revenue you see in the income side is from Waverly Light and Power. Uh, about 60% of our services and commodities is uh, paid for um, by Wave Waverly Light and Power simply because we do the billing, and there's a lot of uh, software maintenance agreements we have and printer maintenance and that type of a thing. Um, part of the allocation goes to, uh, uh, is paid by water, sewer, and solid waste. And then we allocate a little bit out for um, our payroll per person to all also manage the uh, self-insurance fund and a lot of the health insurance issues that come up. So um, if we were gonna reduce our budget, I would, uh, Three areas pro probably. One is that uh, we could switch from a uh, modified accrual basis uh, audit to a cash basis, which would save about $15,000. We could eliminate our work work intern. Uh, we would eliminate travel and tra training and probably cut back on some supplies. That's about it. I just have one question. Yep. Um, I know for years and years we've had that agreement with Waverly Light and Power to, that the city does all the billing, so you get one city bill that has your electric and then all the garbage and water and sewer. Right. Um, has there ever been any talk about having them do their own billing? Sure. Mm -hmm. I just know that, well, yeah, and I, I can see two reasons for that. Obviously, it's less work for you guys, right. um, but then people see that Waverly city bill and they would incorporate all of that cost to the city of Waverly when in fact the majority of that bill is actually Waverly Light Power, you know, electricity. So um, there might be a little disconnect there in residents of knowing what they're getting charged and where it's actually coming from and going to. And we've actually separated that bill so that city services are on top and yeah. the electric portions on the bottom. And um, I think at one time we've even talked about adding the Waverly Light and Power logo to the bill, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, yeah. right. Yeah. you know where I'm going with that. And, yeah. yeah. And there's, there has been some discussion too about um, if the communication utility moves forward, then maybe they would do some sort of billing together on just one letterhead and then okay. ours would be on a separate. Yeah. yeah. So I think in the past it's just kind of been back and forth. Now with the communications utility, being decided, I think, in February, uh, how that's going to move forward, then that's kind of another opportunity to revisit how do we want to do this. It's just one of those things where you get a letter and it comes from the city of Waverly, and so you assume you pay the city of Waverly when, in fact, you're actually paying two different entities. And right. Yep. Good, good question. PR for you if your bill went down every month. You know. We've asked them to take over the billing, but they don't want <laughs> that. You go. So. Yeah. Just another quick question. Um, if we can save $15,000, why wouldn't we change our audit approach? Or We've talked about that in the past, I think. I'm sure you've been in some of those you know, discussions. And I know when PFM comes, you know, they, they stress that modified accrual. It gives a better look at where the city actually is. And I think when we sell our bonds, I think, you know, you could talk between anywhere between 10 and 25 basis points that maybe you save in, you know, the interest costs. There's nothing hard fact that you're going to be able to say, yep, we're saving that much money. But uh, that's kind of the perception we get from Moody's when we talk to them and the perception from public financial management. That was exactly the answer I was looking for. So. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody need a break or should we just keep trucking? Truck. All right. Break. Break. Okay. Keep going. I'll break. take a break. Take a break. All right. I was going to say, I've had a lot of water and coffee too, but.
I don't know if that's going to make me talk faster or just leave. <laughs> leave. Um, next up, we're just going to go through this uh, general fund cash balance for you. Uh, let me just zoom in and we'll scroll down. This is kind of the numbers we've been talking about. But we have our, this is our uh, end of fiscal year 13-14 number and then result of the 14-15 budget operation. So that gets us to 1967371. Projected balance at the beginning of the fiscal year we're budgeting for right now, showing a balanced budget, so a zero, uh, zero up, zero down, and the balance at the end of the year. So that's what we talk about. We're trying to have that 30% target is that number. Then down here is kind of our new idea, and, and you know, call it whatever you want. We're not locked into a title. We're just trying to show the dollar amount on here. Here's where uh, we would start the fund with basically that 3% of, of um, excess. Right now we have above our target in the general fund reserve. Here's the backfill money that would come in over the year in uh, March and September. And then, or I'm sorry, September and March. And then there's where we'd end up at the end of the fiscal year. So that's showing we wouldn't have that 187 right away. It would be building throughout the year. Makes sense for everybody? Okay. Next up, um, actually what I think we'll do is uh, I'm going to skip road use tax for now so that Mike can kind of talk about all of his area at the same time. So I'm going to walk through the TIF fund. And like I said, we can add more time either now or at a different day so that we're not rushed because what I don't want to happen is we blow through all of this and there are questions that we don't get to or there's a discussion that we don't have. This year, we're showing still the, the Grand TIF, which is up top, and the Downtown TIF, uh, which is down below. We're still showing them as separate. Next year, they'll be combined into one. And so when you look at the numbers this year, I had to count and make sure we still had a quorum. Uh, when, you look, <laughs> when you look at the numbers this year, um, what you're seeing is the Grand TIF dropped a little bit, but the Downtown TIF picked it up. So it's still, we're showing an increase overall in um, the TIF fund to pay for the debt service associated with those bonds we issued for uh, the parkway and the airport and part of, uh, I think, 4th Street. The cash balance there, we programmed that into the model that we talked about on Monday night with PFM. And so that all gets counted towards future debt service. It counts towards rebates. It counts towards using TIF for allowable purposes like uh, funding part of economic development as they try to grow business park areas and primary employers. And so those cash balances, uh, those are the ones that are absolutely dedicated to TIF and can't go towards other, other items. I know that that's really hard to read. So. Last week, Tiff, or, uh, Pete Lampy said I had a gold star for paper management, but today I think I'm struggling to get to the bronze. It might just be green. So again, there's downtown TIF, and you can see where those funds are, um, have increased this year because at the county level, they're already looking at it as kind of a combined revenue source. In your books, there are schedules of, of debt service and we've talked about those. I do want to show you a schedule of rebates that we have with different companies. Um, over on the left side here, we've, uh, I don't know, Let's try to get that so the folks at home can see too. You can see some of the historic um, things we've had that are, are, haven't been for the last few years, like Spawn and Rose and Krieger and Advantage and and uh, USDA, Centennial Oaks, and all that. Right now, we have, um, for this year, next year, we have GMT, which is part of that railroad spur, uh, was part of the economic development. This is just a TIF rebate development for their south production facility. Uh, we're in our fourth of five years of a rebate to Fairway. Uh, last year of a small rebate to Crawdaddy Outdoors. And then you can see that next year, uh, we start the downtown hotel rebate. And that's just programmed in for our financial planning. And again, that these figures down here, the grand and the TIF, will be combined into one moving forward since uh, we did that unification amendment. Um, 
in your books, there are also some resolutions of the past that just talk about local option sales tax and the ballot language and how that can be used in hotel motel tax. Um, real quickly, as we get into the local option sales tax financing here in a little bit, um, that's expiring in 2019. So we need to begin the process of discussing a renewal for that one cent sales tax. Uh, right now it goes towards public safety, it goes towards storm drainage, and it goes towards roads and streets. And so I think ballot language is really important. What are we going to use it for? What are the priorities? And then how do we test it? Because it had to be voted on twice last time before it passed. I'll get in here, uh, cable franchise fund, we get 5% of the fees that people pay to Mediacom for their cable and internet in town. And so that's about $25,000 a year. And you can see that that money goes towards um, basically council streaming expenses and video equipment and meeting broadcast costs for this. A little bit goes to the web page too. So we try to keep it in multimedia and fund it for things like today's meeting. Is there any concern with that if and when the Wave of Communications Utility has internet and cable that Mediacom will, won't last? I, there is I mean, still concern compete, for Mediacom, but, uh, but there will, they probably I think we'll probably franchise. have some discussions with Waverly Light and Power similar to on the electricity side and their, their payment in lieu of taxes there or fees there about what will it look on the communication side so that we're not seeing a net deficit in that. I could see Mediacom too being like, well, why would we pay you a 5% franchise fee when you're trying to run us out of town? But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So we have to have a renewal of that too. So. But but the 5% is added on to the bottom of your Mediacom bill. So the customer is really paying for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. But I'm just saying they, they themselves. Right. That would be a way to right. lower their we're, bill. We're seeing it now as in. And they might not want to pay that if. Waverly's offering a supplement without charging that franchise fee, and that could all right. Yeah. Just yeah. a side note, I guess I would say it's not a matter of running them out of town, but just uh, not allowing them to have a monopoly. Yeah, it it'll be. They don't have a monopoly now because you have dish and direct. TV right, but in terms of cable, they streaming. do. Yeah. So those are all things that are in discussion or renewal. Mediacom has been uh, fairly responsive in some areas recently on service requests or new infrastructure. In other areas, they uh, have been less so, and CenturyLink has been basically saying, we're not doing any more infrastructure. Yeah. So. <laughs> a local option sales tax down here. Again, this is about a million dollar uh, fund that we use to help pay for things instead of uh, using property tax for it. Um, again, approved by the voters. It's one cent on uh, applicable sales and services. Uh, of the million dollars coming in, about um, 383000 or $400,000 goes towards debt service, which pays for uh, one fire truck, uh, aerial truck, and the building. Uh, we have 55000 for ambulance reserve, so we put money in there. Uh, we've put money into uh, police vehicles from this account too, so we're hitting the public safety mark. And we also have the transfer for streets and uh, certain projects and road use tax to help with seal coating and things like that. So you can see here, uh, we keep about 10%, or we will we'll have this year about a 10% cash balance in there. Um, so this is, again, we have to use it for only specific things, um, but we're hitting those things that, that have been approved by the voters. Keep going here. We have quite a few of these special revenue funds. Um, hotel motel tax. Uh, we have basically um, a transfer in from general fund because of the routing of the money. Uh, we're projecting $75,000 there again next year. Um, you come down this line, there's some money that goes to the golf course for marketing. Uh, the chamber contribution, we moved it all to here instead of the property tax levy rate. We've taken out the economic development contribution, so there's some net savings. And then we have some money that goes towards our, our signs. Then we've added a line for hotel payments that'll begin in the following 
not this budget that we're planning for now, but the following budget. This next one is a fairly new, a result of the Dry Run Creek. It's the Debt Service Sales Tax Increment Fund. Again, this is a, a portion of the Iowa State sales tax increment that comes back to us to pay for roughly 60% of the Dry Run Creek project. Uh, again, here you can see where the increment was projected for the current year we're in and the proposed. Tim? No. You had something? Okay. I just like the acronym. He's, he likes the stiff, stiff fund. Do, yeah, I know. <laughs> I was surprised that Rich didn't bring that up, but you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chief. I know, you're doing a nice job, too. Thank you. Um, and then down here in this, you can see, sorry, I'm running out of space. This is the transfer back out to debt service. So uh, we'll have a little bit of a cash balance, but again, these are for, I think, 11-year bonds. And so that cash balance will fluctuate as the increment comes in to continue paying for that. Uh, this last one here, and sorry, I already made notes on it, um, but this is that guaranteed reserve, and this is where we do, um, we have a transfer in from Waverly Light and Power towards the W as part of the uh, agreement that was signed. We have our, our uh, budgeted TIF transfer for our portion of the 600000 and then you see that there's the 600 out and the WLP 120 out. Last year, we had that $100,000 in there, which left us the 80,000, so we still have that 80,000. So just so people are aware of kind of how the money's flowing through here. And the last payment is next budget year for that um, 600,000 guarantee, revenue guarantee. And we can provide copies for any of the agreements or anything like that that people would like to see. I'm gonna keep going here. Um, perpetual care. So this is our poor little cemetery fund. Um, this is one where to increase revenues, you don't really want to talk about how you would do that. Um, but there's basically one way to get more revenue in this fund. Anyway, uh, so the contribution here is about <laughs> $5,000. Like I said, I had a lot of coffee. Our cash balance is about 500000 and that, that we keep... Um, by law in a perpetual care fund, the interest that that throws off gets transferred to the general fund, to leisure services, to help offset cemetery operations. And it's not a lot. I think it's between two and $5,000 a year. But that's what it's there for. That's what it goes to. It's kind of like a trust account almost to make sure you can continue to pay for your, your cemetery. Um, right now, there is discussion about a lot of private cemeteries across the state that the organization that created them no longer exists. And people are thinking that those might come back to cities and counties to ma manage and maintain. Um, I don't think that we have that problem here in Waverly, but it's just something to think about kind of long term is who's going to maintain all of this. Employee benefits. This is our account for un uh, unemployment payments to the state of Iowa and uh, 411 police retirement. Uh, this is a... Uh, levy item. So this impacts the property tax levy based on, on the need here. Um, property, you can see property tax is a 278. There's our backfill line and another um, other city tax, which I don't know what that is, Jack, but on other employee benefits. It's the difference between, sorry. It's the difference between the utility tax on the certification. Oh, that's page. right. With, with gas and electric utilities and without gas and electric. So that gives us 300000 in revenue. Uh, you can see that the projected changes to uh, 411 retirement went down. That's a little bit because of that percentage rollback and a little bit because we, have, um, we had vacancies and we have new officers starting over at step one rather than being at step five or six. And then just unemployment compensation down here. And so you see our net fund operations of zero. Okay, and then I want to talk about restricted funds. Just this is more historic than anything, but some uh, grants or loans or contributions are restricted. Um, sometimes we'll get private money for things that's restricted, like we have here. Um, we don't have anything. Uh, we we have a, actually. I'm sorry. 
we have a little bit of uh, net income for band. Sorry, let me zoom out. We have a little bit of net income for trees uh, through our Trees Forever partnership, and then nothing in cemetery reserved income. And then you can see the cash balances at the bottom. So really minor funds that don't do a lot of money movement, but like for Trees Forever, uh, that's a great partnership that Tab talked about last week that gets a lot of trees planted in the community, does a lot of conservation through, a, through an NGO, non-governmental group. Okay. Bill, on the, there is the one sheet that has all of the different reserve funds. Yeah, the summary. The summary. There's, on the dog park fund, it doesn't show. Didn't that, where's that award come into the city? Yes. That? And we will show that in a project account okay. rather than a reserve fund. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this one is, I didn't show it because it's pretty small, but these are like <laughs> everything kind of we've ever had and uh, might have still a small balance in it. So we have Tri-County, um, which is our, I think that's our drug program, uh, drug task force, DARE, uh, drug dog for uh, replacement and bond is what? How old now, Rich? Three or four? Four. Okay. Four years old, and the typical lifespan is seven or eight, eight to ten. So that's a significant investment when we replace the the canine um, parkland for purchases. Again, these are uh, showing a. 15, 16 year history here of in and out And here's where you really look down at the bottom is the balances. Those big numbers can kind of be confusing. Here's where we look at kind of just cash balance for these reserves. Um, you know, like a, a drug dog, I think these numbers might be a little bit outdated, but you can be between 25 and $30,000 for a canine. Um, so is the skate park in a project? It is. Also? Now skate park, I think we actually put that in tabs operating parks operating um, but at a time at one time it was its own designated capital project um, rail trail um, ball diamonds and that kind of all factors into what's going on with Champions Ridge um, community gardens there's they keep a fund there to help with small projects like they did a irrigation project I think recently in the past and that's where that money would come from to get water to those um, Civic Center uh, we've been spending on uh, different improvements there. You'll notice in our operating budget this year, <coughs> rather than a capital project, we had the uh, carpet and the walls. And then we have transfers and totals. Um, debt service, we discussed Monday night. Uh, for the upcoming bonds, because of the change in dry run, what we're projecting or we're projecting right now was just um, a bond issuance next year for the dry run project. We had put out some of those other projects. Uh, we do get bids for the dry run back on February 5th, and so then that will dictate where we set those bonds. We did have uh, PFM do an analysis, and for um, basically adding $250,000 of sidewalks back in to stay in our rotation, it's an increase of about 1.3 cents to the debt levy. Um, or there's a possibility we can absorb some of that with cash balance and not have to impact the property tax debt levy. Basically, for every $250,000, it's 1.3 cents. So 500 is 2.6, and then um, 750 is 3.9 or, or 4 cents. So there is some capacity to, to add money back in. We've, we've budgeted a transfer uh, that we'll get to to help sidewalks out too so that we can stay on some sort of regular pace. So I wanted to update you with that, and we'll send out uh, that email so you have that too. Overall, let's look at, we can look at the summary here. The revenues for debt service really, the bulk of it is, is property tax, like we've talked about before. Um, that's about the best I'm going to be able to do. But you have it in front of you, so you can see, and it's at the tables. Um, One million from property tax, about thirty-seven thousand from the backfill. We have the gas and electric at seventeen, 
And then you see that transfer from lost that goes towards the fire truck and the fire station like we talked about there of almost 400,000. We have that transfer from uh, sales tax increment fund of 203,000. And then we have TIF of almost a million dollars uh, for the general uh, downtown fund contributions of 100,000. And then water fund and sewer fund transfers for geo bonds of about $400,000 together. So overall, our, our annual revenues for the next year, we're anticipating uh, about $3.1 million for payment on debt service. And then we can go through um, down below the line here. You basically see what of which each of these, we call them series, so each annual issue of, of bonds costs for our annual debt service and what it went towards starting in 2012. This sheet here then goes through 13, 14, and 15. Um, you can see how these ladder off as they're paid off. Um, so we've paid, we're paying some off this year, the 2014, uh, I'm sorry, let's see. Those are new ones coming on. I had that backwards. Look at it the other way. So those are new ones coming on, and we'll see in the long one where we have them coming off. And then next year we have the taxable bonds for uh, essentially right now, these are just dry run creek projects. And I think a little bit for the airport out of TIF, and a little bit for the dry run out of TIF. So again, net fund operations comes down to zero. Money in, money out. Um, these next few are really hard to see, especially for the folks at home, and I apologize, but really here's where we're talking about kind of as things come off. This is when you look at it, go out horizontally, you can see that in 18, 19, we're done with the fire station. In 17 and 18, we pay off these 2008 uh, bonds. Um, 2009 is paid off in 19, mostly 10-year bonds. Um, 2011 to 2021 and so you see out here kind of into the future we don't have anything budgeted for local option sales tax because it requires that renewal um, as TIF comes off we don't have really anything budgeted out past 2021 for uh, these TIF items we do now for the Cedar River Parkway um, and so that's what we'll show here 2022 for water and sewer um, this 2013 land this was that um, part one of Champions Ridge out there along Highway 3. I think in a few years we have the option for part two comes due to buy the other 60 some acres. Uh, here's the 2014 dry run and, and um, pool project. Here we can see these had to extend out to 15 years for the parkway. Um, and then now in 2015 we have these uh, 10, 11, and 12 year bonds for the Dry Run Creek, 4th Street, and the airport. And this is the bond issue that we could add in some sidewalks to if we wanted to. So then down below, there's kind of an interesting line that just shows you what our annual debt service is anticipated to be uh, over time, <coughs> year by year. How much of that is principal? How much is interest? And again, just kind of a short synopsis of all of that together per issue down here at the very bottom. So this is just a nice reference sheet. Again, um, I don't know that I can pull it out far enough, but you can just see the old stuff paying off, the new stuff coming on, and still we try to keep that within a reasonable, usually 10-year time horizon, but because of the Cedar River Parkway and the revenue source, it had to go to 15. Any questions on debt service? Okay. Now let's talk about capital projects. Actually, before I do that, I'm sorry. Um, I need to think here. Mike, how much time do you need to go through your areas? Three hours. Okay. Uh, I don't think he's kidding. Um, we can, capital projects won't take too long because we've already kind of talked about those and there are not a lot of changes to our small ones and the big ones are, are things like the dry run and, and things we constantly discuss. The things that I want Mike to talk about are road use tax because that's all state uh, financing because of the fuel tax. 
and then the enterprise funds. So I'll leave it up to you guys. How would you like to use the remaining 40 minutes and then moving on from there? Because we can go into Mike's areas now and have him walk through that uh, and save capital projects for like a study session uh, or even a, a extra session on the, maybe on the second. We can put it on the second for discussion on that meeting. Is that fair? And and you can you have it so you can read it and tell me if there are questions or, or whatever. Okay. So let's go back then to road use tax. And again, road use tax is interesting because it really funds all of our operations. I'm, yeah, anybody needs a break, please take it because we're just going to keep, keep rolling. Road use tax really funds all of that that you see folks out doing on the streets or um, in the alleys or on the curb work. Uh, it's everything from paying for snow plows, uh, trucks, to the time in the seat, to um, even some roadside vegetation management, I think. So I'll let Mike continue to do this and stall for a little bit of time. The big issue with road use tax that we talked about last week is the fact that the revenues from road use tax are moving at about half to 1% a year. Um, and until something is done with the state formula for fuel tax, uh, we know we can't really control per capita other than our goals to grow the community and they only measure that every decade for their formula. Um, we have to get creative on our side for controlling expenses or finding alternative revenues. So with that, Mike Cherry, everybody. I guess I'd kind of like to wait until uh, Dan gets back um, so that we have everyone here. I think um, what I want to talk about is very important as far as uh, the growth of the community. You know, we talk about we need growth, growth is good, but also growth adds challenges and um, like Dan to have an opportunity to uh, see this stuff as well. So if anyone else wants to step out for a moment, that'd be fine. But um, Do you have a joke or anything? No, I don't. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, two engineers walked into a bar. <laughs> Third one ducked. That's there it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and had a good time. Okay. They designed the bar so they wouldn't have walked. <laughs> and there was enough clearance. <laughs> okay. So what I, I've, I've got here, this has been in uh, previous annual reports. Um, the graphs are missing the, the two most current years of data, but it gives a, a snapshot of what's been happening to the community over the last uh, about 18 years. So uh, as far as infrastructure, with uh, water, sewer, and solid waste. Uh, water's in blue, sewer's in green. Uh, streets are in black. Um, this is, is charting the number of miles that we have. And so we have um, a 38% or 36% increase in sewer mains, 38% in water mains, and a 17% increase in the number of lane miles, or not lane miles, road miles. Uh, we've probably actually seen some additional lane miles beyond that. What's the difference between those two? Well, if you, if, if you have just like a typical two-lane roadway or residential street, um, that's fine. But if you have a four-lane roadway, like 10th Avenue Southwest, that is um, every mile would have four lane miles as opposed to two lane miles for, for that. So. Um, that's important when you start thinking about the number of square yards and the number of lanes that have to be maintained for snow removal and other operations. Especially larger uh, arterial roads. Mm -hmm. On the garbage side, uh, we've had a 20% increase in the number of customers. What's the, what's the time period here again? 95, 96 fiscal year to 11, 12. Okay. Yeah, so I am missing the past previous two years. Um, but again, it's a good snapshot of, of where we've been and, and maybe an indication of where we're 
oh. where we're headed here because Waverly is continuing to be a growing community. Uh, we've also seen the number of lift stations in town grow from four to ten lift stations that are now in operation and being maintained. Just a quick note on lift stations. Um, you know, those are an interesting bird because you need them for development, especially with being a river community with a lot of change in terrain. But they're also, they're not very redundant. They're high maintenance, they're high cost. And so it's kind of like all of our infrastructure, it comes at a price and, and you want to be very proactive in maintaining these because if you don't, you have some homes with big problems. <laughs> During this time period, we've also, with the development and with new uh, regulations, uh, we've seen um, a, a tremendous growth in the number of stormwater management facilities throughout the community. and. This one's going to be a little hard to see. I almost kind of want to zoom in so you can move around. But, but in the same time period, we've, we've added you know, more than a dozen detention facilities that need to be maintained uh, throughout the community. You can't just build them and ignore them. These, these become public uh, green spaces and facilities that, that need to be uh, maintained and managed, just like uh, other, uh, other infrastructure. So. Uh, this has all been done with literally no growth in personnel within the public works di divisions. So you, you have basically what amounts to five and a half people allocated towards street maintenance. 20% growth in streets, no change in personnel. Same thing in solid waste, five and a half people. And, and, and just the number of stops has grown, but look at the other features that have been added with, with the yard waste operations and, and the curbside recycling. You know, all those, all those features have been added in without additional personnel. The other thing, while we're still here, those other ones were from 95, 96. Um, no, horizontal axis here starts in 1980. So what is going to lead some of the discussion, you know, these are things I want you to keep in mind as we step through the, the road use tax budget, the water budget, the salt waste budget, the sewer budget, is these growth in the community and in the, in the projected growth. We're not advocating that we increase our personnel force at this time, but at some point that has to really be a serious discussion as to what we do in that respect. How do we manage our, our facilities, our, our infrastructure, whether it's water mains or sewer mains, uh, the salt waste operations and streets? How do we manage those? And the way I'd characterize it is down here, we have things that we absolutely must do. Okay, so on, on the, the water supply side, our obligation, our requirement to our citizens is provide them a safe, reliable source of drinking water. And with that, there are state and federal regulations that must be met. That's what we absolutely must do. Then there are things that we should be doing. We should be maintaining and, and repairing and replacing our infrastructure in a timely manner. Now, where, uh, and then there are things that we we could be doing. And so think of uh, on our sanitary sewer collection system. What are some things that at some point, you know, if we have resources available, we could be doing? Infiltration studies, cross connections. Do we have um, clean water from uh, storm drains or sump pumps that are going into our collection system? Cedar Falls is now beginning that. Those really become shift from could do to should do to maybe down to must do when they start impacting your ability to treat the water. If you're faced with a $10 million wastewater treatment plant expansion because you're now bumping up against your limits, you may want to move that infiltration study and cross connection into a must do. It may be much more economical to try to eliminate that clean water that's getting into the system as opposed to building your plant. 
I think we should be operating, and for the most part, I think we do operate. Yeah, I'm here uh, for you. Yeah, about halfway between. I would like to see us operating above this line here, that we are proactively going out, repairing and replacing our infrastructure. You get down below this line and you're putting fires out, you're chasing things around. And you, you, you can't afford to get down in here. If you're, if you're playing, uh, uh, if your operations are down here where, where you're reactionary and you're, you're chasing your problems around, it doesn't take very much to bump you down into a situation where you're in non-compliance on, on a regulatory issue. Okay. Again, I think for the most part, our operations are, are up here um, when it's our water and wastewater. Uh, there are some portions of those operations that I think are sitting down here that need to very much be addressed. And those are things that we continue to, to look at what are our resources and where should we be going so that we're proactively going out and addressing uh, maintenance and, and repair issues as opposed to waiting for a failure and then chasing them down. So our, um, with our, uh, this is a, a 35 year history of our um, water and sewer system, our, our rate structure. And what is uh, shown on here, and this is in your budget books, is that it gives you a history of significant projects that the city has undertaken over the past 35 years because they help explain why our rates are what they are today. In 1977, the city of Waverly undertook a major annexation. We then extend it um, uh, over the next 20 years. <coughs> we undertook some very significant projects to extend water and sewer mains to Highway 3 East to the city limits, to 218 South to the city limits. Uh, in uh, about 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, major undertakings were to take it to the Northeast into the Murphy Edition area, and then also to the northwest out to Cedar Glen. We built wells, we built water towers, we built a new wastewater treatment facility in 1980. So that helps us kind of talk to why our rates are what they are today. More recently, since about 2000, we saw our, our rates move away from the consumer price index. Um, and that you need to think of the yellow line as really a reference line that can be shifted up or down. It's, it's more simply to look at what's been happening as it relates to the consumer price index. And this is one where regulatory requirements shift the effect off of that consumer price index. You know, you think, well, water and sewer rates, you know, maybe they could just keep, keep going up with about the cost of inflation. But due to regulatory changes, it can cause them to go up faster. And that's what we're seeing, what we saw both in Waverly's rates, but also the statewide rates. So um, the solid lines, the blue and green, that's been our, our, um, our track record over the past um, yeah, 35 year history, but I want you to really be focusing in on like the last 15 years. The dash lines are trend lines for the statewide average and they uh, reflect actual um, survey data that we have. Uh, the early years it was the Ames water and sewer rate study that was done. Uh, later years it was um, Jack, I don't know if you can help me out. I, I was trying to remember where some of that stuff came from, but Your engineers, I there, there's some other agencies that are, are doing rate surveys. But what we've also heard from uh, our financial managers, as well as uh, what we're hearing from like Intercog that other communities are faced with, 
statewide water and sewer rates are increasing at four to five percent a year to deal with aging infrastructure and regulatory requirements. I think we're in very good shape going forward on our water and sewer. Today, our water and sewer rates are basically average or maybe even slightly below. Over the last 10 years, we've averaged a 2.5% annual rate increase, and that's what we forecast for the foreseeable future for like the next five years uh, looking out. Continue with the 2.5%. Given that projection, Waverly is going to potentially be in the neighborhood of 10% below the statewide average for water and sewer rates. Okay. So, in looking at um, some things that, uh, kind of examples of things that we should be doing. <clears throat> this is a nice intersection that shows uh, the fixtures that have been brought to the surface, uh, these are water valves, um, storm and sanitary sewer manholes that are readily accessible to our, our, our staff. But much of our community continues to have manholes like this that have been seal coated over and patched over. These are things that we should be addressing and are not addressing. So just more examples here, manholes that have been patched over, seal coat o coated over, aren't readily accessible, uh, curb and gutters that haven't been repaired. Um, you know, this is a settlement over a, a service line, a trench. Um, Here's other sections of curb and gutter that's literally just falling apart, um, needs replacement. We've got intakes that uh, are basically the entire top section needs to be rebuilt, if not the intake itself. So these are things that presently today aren't being done, and that's where getting, if you can get the green one, that one right there. I would say that it's not in a failed condition, but it's not, I'd say we're down here, and I think we should be up here in having those things well-maintained and accessible. And the problem with that is the balance between manpower, resources, availability, and then quite frankly, getting into kind of a mode of putting out fires and fixing worst first, and this other stuff, you almost have to wait until it's bad enough to get to it. And that's not a case in everything, but I think it, a lot of it is just trying to figure out what to do. Where are some things that we could be doing more of? Or let me talk about things that, uh, again, kind of touch upon things that we should be doing. Um, you know, this past summer we got in talking about the, the condition of the Dry Run Creek and the lack of mowing and maintenance on those things. Vegetation management is one area that we may not be in this bottom part here. We may be in this must-do situation. We have some locations that look like this that most people would probably say is not acceptable, and we must do something about it. So we have other detention facilities. We have lots of detention facilities around town. Um, many of them kind of look like this. It's nice, it's green. Go in there, somewhat mow it, maintain it. Uh, we have others that have had very little attention to them. They have 
thistles and other weeds, and they have sucker trees growing up in and around the discharge points and other areas. Uh, out the industrial park, um, almost the entire wet pond is surrounded by, by sucker trees that have grown up. At the very least, it'd be nice to get those back to this, but this is a situation where, um, you know, I'd say this is getting us back to where we should be. And um, here's another good example of one. Uh, this is down by 10th Avenue. Uh, but there is opportunity to enhance it further. And that's where I would say you would be, you want to shift up into that, what we could be doing. What I'm looking for is down by the middle school because they've done a, uh, they did a really nice job of um, building that uh, detention facility down there. But I think you guys get the idea of yeah. what current conditions is somewhere they're, they're good, other areas are kind of medium, and other areas are just kind of left because we, we don't right. get to them now, so. The median down by um, high V. Uh, Miller True Value. This is where I'd say this is things you could be doing more of. But th this is kind of taking it to that, that higher level. And, um, you know, up by Wartburg, they have these pocket prairie areas that we can be uh, incorporating into our, our uh, green space and detention facilities. And they just kind of elevate it to to a little bit nicer, nicer status within the uh, community. So uh, from that, we can shift on into road use tax. And get into this discussion. Do you need your... As Phil indicated earlier, the, the road use tax revenues that we receive from the state, um, they, they make up the majority of this, this budget. Um, the projections are to grow um, about 50 cents, maybe up to $1 per capita per year. So that's the half a percent to 1% annual growth in revenue. So this has been going on now for about six, seven years. Mm -hmm. So in, in effect, we've been kind of budget cutting two and a half percent out of road use tax every single year. That's less and less road maintenance that, that basically takes place. Now, what has helped offset that? The local option sales tax that it's been used to help uh, on our collector street system uh, help fund federal dollars that we've been fortunate enough to receive. We used to get a share of uh, federal funding uh, distributed through Intercog annually, but because there's been no growth in that fund, uh, we're now down to about every other year, just as every other agency that's a member of Intercog is. The funds just aren't there. This is the one area where you can, where we're, <laughs> The things that we, sh we sh should be doing, we keep going lower and lower and lower on that yellow bar because there simply aren't funds available for that. We've had a 17 plus percent growth in our infrastructure, but no additional growth in staffing. And yet I think that we've done a pretty good job of, of maintaining a uh, uh, at the very least, a, a flat level of service, and we've been able to uh, do that through advances in equipment, and that's something that's been uh, very helpful for us as a, a strong and, and a good e vehicle equipment replacement <coughs> schedule, and that was something that was mentioned previously, that we have 
every piece of equipment within the community, um, whether it's uh, um, uh, fire, golf course, street, solid waste, police department, our mechanics track all of it and we identify when is an optimum time to replace this equipment based off of uh, maintenance records as well as uh, resale value. And, and uh, that's how we're, I think, able to continue to effectively maintain our infrastructure, in particular our road system, with upgrades in, in equipment. And that's also, uh, I think, been very key in the Salt Waste Department for us as well, that as our local landfill in Bremer County closed and we had to now truck material down to uh, Blackhawk County that we've been able to co uh, continue to provide a high level of service and grow our service options uh, through the um, ability to, in a timely manner, replace equipment, upgrade equipment, and get more versatile <coughs> equipment. So in um, the road use tax, about 52% of it is personnel. Uh, literally 100% of the revenue is coming from the state. We are to the point, though, that as we said about six, seven years ago, we, uh, we had to start funding the seal coating program with transfers from the local option sales tax in order to maintain that program. I, I, I don't know how we, or why you would try to get a 10% cut in, in this account. If you did, literally 100% of it would come from personnel, and that would require um, you know, if, if you want to cut to try to make dollars go further, it's basically going to come from personnel. Okay. The funds that are in road use tax are not restricted to the main thoroughfares, that type of thing. They're allocated out to all streets, correct? That's correct. Correct. So if, <clears throat> if one option that we've kicked around a little bit is if we renew the lost funding putting a major portion of that to streets. Looking back, there's about a million dollars in lost money coming in. Mm -hmm. We're spending about a million dollars now in road use tax, so we could almost double what we'd be able to do if we put the majority of loss towards roads and streets. And Correct. I think a good policy discussion with that would be to, if, if that was the case, would be to maybe by percentages, set aside a certain percentage that would have to go towards residential streets, the non-federal aid street system. Because they're the ones that are getting left behind. There's nothing, literally nothing being done with those streets, uh, the, you know, the typical residential streets. Um, we've been trying to leverage our local option sales tax dollars by pairing them up with federal dollars, but those are only available on our collector street systems, and we've made tremendous progress in rebuilding those. But these streets have to be maintained. Um, so that means when they, they get to be 20, 25 years old, and this, this also means all new subdivision streets. 20, 25 years old, they're going to they're gonna need kind of a major rehab. They're going to need uh, maybe a mill and overlay. And if you live in a part of the community that's 100 years old, you're sitting there going, well, why? Why are you milling and overlaying a street that's only 25 years old when mine's 100 years old? It's fiscally the right thing to do to at the right time go in there and do a maintenance treatment as opposed for waiting it to, for it to fail. And there's all kinds of data on that that says that you'll spend four times as much money to rebuild it as you will to maintain it. Okay, an interesting thing about our street system about our, our road use tax is we do snow removal. And um, this information comes out of the usclimatedata.com website, and I had to go through month by month, year by year, but this is measurable snowfall, snowfall events uh, out of the Waterloo area. That was the closest area I could get data for. So uh, we typically average about uh, 20, 24 measurable snow events every year, of which um, less than half of those are more than one inch. We only average a six inch plus snowfall 
every other year. Um, that's, I'd consider a major snowfall event. A moderate snowfall is in that three to six inch range. And we average about five of those per year. So we want to size our operations around um, kind of in that five moderate snowfall events a year. And so one of the things that we're going to be able to do with the new public services facility is we're going to look at um, actually reducing the number of plow trucks that we have. And we're going to, again, this is where a good equipment replacement program is very helpful because with the new um, accessories and, and packages that you can get them set up on, uh, we're looking at starting to add small wings on our residential plow trucks. And what's the impact in going from six residential trucks down to five? Well, if it takes, um, say, five hours for six trucks to cover the entire city, that's 30 hours of plowing. If we go down to five trucks, it'll mean an additional hour on the streets for each truck. But with our new facility, the doors are wider. We go from 10, 10 foot doors to 12 foot doors, or is it 12 to 14? 12 to 14. 12 to 14. We're now going to be able to have additional attachments on those trucks and still get them indoors. These are some efficiency things that we gain from the new facility, from a new public services facility is that we have the ability now to look at um, further enhancing our fleet with equipment that allows us to more efficiently and effectively continue to maintain our infrastructure. Do you have specific questions about the road use tax fund? I think the decisions on trucks, would those be in the next budget? Or those in this budget? Yeah, they're they're in the next year's budget. So they wouldn't be this year, but that's just the idea of with added equipment, you can have about the same level of efficiency with fewer resources going right. into it. Then I think that's a very good idea. I mean, we talked about that a little bit the other day. But. With the garbage trucks, too. You know, again, these garbage trucks that we're buying would not fit in do inside our, our existing facilities. It's only because our bays are, in, in particular, the doors are wider and taller that we're able to, to get this equipment inside. Can we go to water next? Sure. I guess I have a question about roads. What are we looking at over the next couple of years? You know, if uh, the state actually does decide to redo Bremer Avenue, you know, we have a large responsibility, the, the non-lane right. portion of that. I mean, first in 17. I don't with know that what would. that means yet as far as dollars, but we would have responsibility for the parking lanes and any storm sewer upgrades and in, you know underground infrastructure that would occur with that, and that's primarily our storm sewer system. I know that there are intakes that need to be replaced. Um, I don't know how many at this point, but there would be some of that. Uh, in addition to whatever they choose to do with um, uh, uh, the parking lanes. I'm not anticipating a reconstruction project. I'm anticipating that it's maybe a, a significant mill and overlay like they did in 96. Would that be something we can, would be redundant if we did a study of it to kind of anticipate our costs on that or? I think that we can, we can take recent you know, if it's a three inch or five inch mill and overlay figures and just do the math and say, here's essentially what it could cost us. Because well, uh, I'm thinking on the storm sewers and things like that, to, that's going to be a different cost than the mill and overlay, correct? If we have to do some of those. Yeah. I, yeah. If you're asking me, give me, throw a number, I'm going to say a million dollars. Is it how much north of there or south of there it is, I don't know. Well, I'm just wondering there, if, if it's worth doing a study that would actually go out and look at them. On the, how many we on have to do? Steward? Yeah, how many we would have to in do. In advance of when the actual is the project? I mean, right, pieces? just so that we have that kind of in the back of our minds for uh, budgeting it, purposes. It sounds like the project will occur in 2017, which would mean we would need to budget 
reimbursement funds for 1718. All right, let's move on to water. The blue blue sheets. Do you want to go over the overview or just right into the just dollars? Go right into the dollars. Which one over this one? Or the other one? The ex revenues and expenses? Well, I guess it's all together. So in, in the water fund, uh, we have about a $1.3 million budget. 43% is personnel, 32% for debt service. 8% for utilities and water treatment, and then there's about 17% for other expenses. Um, you know, those other expenses become, uh, a lot of it is the repair and maintenance and, and continually upgrading. Um, you know, and that's where, you know, if you want to start cutting out of there, um, you know, if you want to see a, what, how would you achieve a 10% reduction in your, in your user fees, you would, strip out a lot of the proactive maintenance, such as, you know, even like painting fire hydrants. You, you would pretty much stop doing that. Uh, proactively um, going out and replacing older hydrants, valves, those types of things. And you'd become more reactionary into when you have problems. Uh, we have, uh, I think in the annual report, Brian indicated about, on average, we have about we respond to about 20 water main breaks a year throughout the community. Um, sometimes we have no reason why the main breaks. Uh, other areas we have uh, some sections of town that they're a little more problematic and we have identified some of those that we would like to go in and, and replace at some point. So um, they're not cheap to replace uh, so, you know, you start looking at, you know, if you spend a couple thousand dollars to repair the leak, you know, you can probably afford to repair a few leaks before you spend half a million on the replacement. So those are things that we're always mindful of, but we're also mindful of how does that impact uh, the service to our customers. <clears throat> well, and then also, I mean, if you're saying we could save about $50,000, I mean, is that net or, I mean, I'm guessing if we aren't proactive, then there will be some other costs associated with that. It, it, you, you basically kind of start digging this, this hole deeper and deeper that um, those are things that still need to be maintained. Uh, you know, if you choose not to replace the roof on your car or the roof on your house, eventually at some point it's going to start to leak and, and give you more significant problems. So th those are things that need to be addressed. Again, to achieve a sustained 10% cut, it, it's you know, it cut labor. So if you cut your labor, um, it's not about cutting a person out. You got three people in the water department. That hasn't changed in in half century, more. I, I don't know. It's maybe wow. always been three people. Um, so your only opportunity is cut, cut their hourly pay. You cut their hourly pay, you're not going to have anyone working there, and, yeah. and now you, you're in the red because you don't have any certified staff working. The other, the other thing in, in the utility funds is um, interdepartmental charges and debt service. And so as, as uh, you all know, we've had uh, some bonds left for a water loop, um, some water project improvements, and then pure revenue bonds, which are for public services, which don't impact property taxes, but do impact utility rates. And then we have interdepartmental charges where those departments, which are more of the general administration, <coughs> uh, do a percent back to water and sewer. So if you cut that area too, the chargebacks, it's just I guess it's kind of like when you look at the budget, it's kind of like a ball of string and you start pulling on one and the whole thing kind of, it's, it's not always just neat and precise. What are you looking for? The inverted, uh, the red, you know, green. Oh, your stoplight? Just, just on the topic of, I guess, being proactive for maintenance and stuff, haven't we kind of talked in the past, and we've done some comparisons between communities around us, why our water rates are so much higher, it's because we're doing that proactive work compared to some of the other communities, I guess. Yeah, I have not seen a rate. Do you have a rate study 
for surrounding communities? No, but it, it goes back to we okay, yeah, we, we created it because of the, the growth of our community and the need to extend water and sewer service out to, to the city limits in every direction of the community. That's how our rates <coughs> got to where they are. Other, every other community is going to be unique and different. Um, but when we look at a, the statewide average, <coughs> we're, we're about average. And I think that projecting out five years, we're going to be below average on, on our water and sewer rates, as, as is indicated by the trends, as they're trying to um, comply with changes in, in regulatory requirements. Um, we're in good shape. Uh, there were changes in disinfection requirements. Uh, we were ahead of the curve. We had funds available set aside in, in these uh, facility reserve accounts to help fund those <coughs> projects. Uh, where are we on the, on the water side with this? I'd, I'd say we're, we're right where right where we want to be. We're, we're on the upper portion of that yellow section of things that we should be doing. So I, it's, it's not misery and despair. I mean, right. it's where other than <laughs> there's a little bit of misery and despair in, in the road use um, because of our only source of revenue right now is really coming from the state, and, and they're the ones that get to dictate what the fuel taxes and things are. But even there, I mean, we're, it's, it's not dire, it's just things that we're very mindful of and planning, and planning for. Yeah, planning. Yeah. So, so again, I, I, you know, the water system, even, even the sewer system, we're, we're, we're on the upper half of that yellow section doing the things we should be doing. And that's, I, I think, showing up in the fact that as we project out and go forward, our rates are going to end up being lower than the statewide averages. Yeah, talk about <coughs> which one would you like to do next on WPC or sewer? Yeah, on well, WPC. With the water, this is completely off budget talk, but we add fluoride to our water still. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Has there been any discussion about? I've had some people ask me about that and send me studies and articles about how fluoride. There's been studies that it's not good to ingest that much fluoride. Has there been any talk of other cities removing it from their water supply? Or? Um, at times. And I guess coming out of the water business, if council would like to take up a discussion on the addition or removal of fluoride, I'll leave that up to the council. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering. I've had people come to me and, yeah, it can and be you know, there's studies all with different issue. ways. But right. um, right. it's some a, interesting it's a, stuff out there about it. There's been discussions at the state level about the fluoride levels and the One part per million. Less that, uh, you, know. you can have less than that. You have a little flexibility, so you can be a little bit below that. And that's what we try to do is stay, again, stay within the state drinking water standards and the, right. and the federal uh, Safe Drinking Water Act. I think that that's something for us. It's, it's a policy decision because it's a cost, and it, it's some manpower because you have to test specifically for your fluoride levels and make the rounds and, and do that sort of thing. Um, but it's not a major thing, and so it's just right. a question of there's some naturally occurring in the background of groundwater anyway, depending on where you pull your water from. And um, I've just seen it in certain communities, usually larger communities or larger college communities, it becomes a very contentious discussion about what is the true impact, how do you know, what right. does it mean? I've just seen articles and studies, and some right. of them Let's say it's bad for you. And some of them stand right. by, Jay, here. Des Moines has had that discussion. Yeah, so it, definitely something we can provide some information on. Kind of like how you're not supposed to actually eat your toothpaste. You know, you're supposed to spit it. Which is a trick with four-year-olds. <laughs> yeah, right. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, WPC is is next, and you want to start with that one? Ooh. Right. You want to go there? Just one. Just one. <laughs> yeah, I can hold it for you if you want.
There's, there's nothing really. Um, it, it's a very routine budget. Uh, there is one item for vehicle replacement that's to replace the one of the pickups that we have out there. Uh, otherwise, with WPC, it's um, uh, between the, the personnel and interdepartmental charges, 45% is labor, 30% debt service, 17% for utilities and treatment supplies. There's only 8% that is what would account for everything else. And, and so again, to try to um, receive a 10% cut or 10% reduction in, in uh, the user fees, it's, it's going to be very heavy on, on um, cutting wages. Again, there's only three people assigned to the plant out there that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, uh, long term to try to cut it, you'd be cutting again that repair and maintenance of, of the facility. Our plant is in good condition. Um, we have recently completed a, a study on the trickling filters to get a more precise uh, more precisely determine the, the remaining life in them. And uh, the next, that would be the next major project at the facility, and that is estimated to occur around 2020 uh, or shortly after. So uh, what you'll see in the, in the budget, um, Bill, if you can show that up, is that we're starting to set aside funds for that project and into, uh, I think you need this one. In, into um, designated facility reserve fund. Oops, sorry. Yeah, facility reserve balance. Going forward, what we would like to do is on our collection system is start designating some funds to be used for the repair and maintenance of our collection system. So this is um, doing a more thorough inspection of the manholes of the collection system itself and, and basically taking the approach that we are with the sidewalk program where we very thoroughly go into a district you know, maybe we do the same seven districts and go in there and do a very thorough inspection and assessment of our infrastructure, the condition of the manholes, the condition of the, of the mains themselves, and identify manholes that may need to be replaced or lined, uh, or uh, the same thing with our collection system with the sewer mains is that we may need to um, instigate a lining program, which can help eliminate some of that infiltration issues that we have and do a better job of maintaining and, and inspecting the mains and manholes associated with our sewer collection system. That's where, in, in that respect, I think we're maybe on the lower side of that, of that uh, should do. We do a good job of of um, cleaning and doing root control and uh, some televising. But we're not doing other types of projects that will actually repair and prevent the infiltration of water. That's where we're, we're trying to set aside some funding to move up that scale, especially on the collection side, knowing that any extra drop that gets in there that we don't have to treat costs money. And failures of the line cost people a lot of money. Do you do that by mostly like fixing lines or is there a way to see if older homes have sump pumps and things going into the water supply or? Yes, all, all, all of, of it, above? all of the above. Yeah, it's pretty multifaceted right. because, um, you know, there are tests to do that and at the same time when you're televising you can uh, see what the condition is. Do we need a slip line? Do we need to upgrade manholes where it just might be leaking groundwater? What I like to 
the way I like to describe this, we need to get our own house in order before we go out to the public and ask them. So I want to make sure that we're doing the things we should be doing to, to help with that inf infiltration and maintain our, our manholes and sewer mains. If, if we take the seven-year approach on, on going out and doing that, maybe at that point we start asking the homeowners to, to step up and, and start addressing that issue. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I get to see a lot of older homes having leaping systems and mm -hmm. salt pumps and all kinds of things that are running into the sanitary sewer, which is not good. Yeah, exactly. Or just went through or is having to do that with trying to pay people to fix yep. the earths and take them out of their homes. Yeah. Well, we got the rental code done before they did, so maybe we'll get this done before they did. <laughs> okay, do you want to talk about this sheet next? Just uh, yeah, you can put that, put that in there. Um, you, you have the graphs that give you the 35-year history of our water and sewer rates. This is just in a... Tabular. A little, yeah, tabulated rather than a graphical format. Um, and shows uh, some additional information on solid waste in there as well so just more information um, on where we've been and where we are and um, if we can touch upon uh, line maintenance line maintenance it's it's mostly labor this year we're we're completing the purchase of the jet machine um, for this year otherwise it's it's just uh, um, a, a lot of labor, not much else for, for um, you know, we do have some in there for supplies, for castings, for manholes and those types of things. Uh, want to get these, uh, we've got two people assigned to, to line maintenance, want to get these people um, in addition to, <laughs> again, they kind of feel like all they spend their time on doing is, is somewhat chasing down problems with, with, um, um, you know, they, well, they don't spend all their time. They do some time uh, getting called out, chasing, chasing down some problems. Um, a lot of times it's roots uh, in the sewer system. Um, but they do a pretty good job of uh, during the summer months going out there and, and proactively televising and looking for these issues and then treating them. But there are other areas in the infrastructure that we need to, I think, ramp it up. And that's, you know, getting um, a really good inspection program going on our manholes and then actually addressing those those concerns. Anything else on no, line no. maintenance? These same two also do um, storm sewer maintenance. Uh, right now, your Waverly bill has um, a sewer charge that goes towards your sanitary sewer and it also has, uh, I believe, a portion towards your storm sewer. That's how we split it up in-house anyway. The money is all coming in. It looks as a sewer bill, but we use some of that money for solid or uh, sand storm. The, the, their, whatever. Their um, available time has been really been pushed onto, you know, keeping the the sanitary mains open and operational. That, you know, I showed you a, a photograph of a storm sewer intake that was the, the entire top section was was really kind of disintegrating. They haven't, they haven't done any intake replacement or, or virtually no intake reconstruction. Um, they do. They do some, they, and it's more as a reactionary if we get a yeah. call on, but they got a problem. To, um, we end up usually doing about oh, five to ten a year that they'll go in and, and it, restore. It's, it's a yep. lot of repair type work, though. Rebuilding. So, so again, we've got. I, I almost want to say, you know, like over a thousand intakes and, and things like that. You know, you do ten a year. What's the life expectancy yeah. on this stuff? So it's our century plan. Yep. <laughs> Anything else on storm sewer? No, no. It, we have talked in the past about a storm sewer utility and looking into that someday to look at what is an equitable share for that. So that's something that um, we'll put on a future study session for you know, the following fiscal year's budgets. We're not proposing that now. We're just looking at how could we come up with something to equitably fund this at the appropriate level, knowing that 
at the state and federal level, there's a lot of focus right now on stormwater management, non-point um, water pollution, which is runoff and erosion and all of that. Just one point on there, the, there's the contract for the USGS um, river gauge. What's yes. our status with that in terms of getting it calibrated back to just a little, a little closer to... We've talked about this in the past and it's not the accuracy or... or because of the old levels in the new dam. Oh, we're we're good on all that. We're, yeah. It's just but. we have new numbers we have to use for basically gauge height. It doesn't mean what it did before the dam. So internally, we've adjusted some of those figures. But you're, I, I think maybe are you asking, are they going to start doing flood predictions for Waverly? Right. Are we going to be able to use that for that purpose, or are we still kind of getting data to... to Bill. Yep. There, um, we have uh, through through the state of Iowa um, flood flood center. There's flood inundation mapping that is tied to gauge levels. Yep. So you you go in there and those are correlated back and forth. So in effect, that is our our. Um, our correlation is to be able to go in and based off of projected yep. levels, look at the flood inundation Last maps. Last couple of years, I mean, for some reason they skip over us and go from Charles City to Janesville. Right, because always. those haven't moved, yeah. But um, in the last couple of years, when there is a flood event, don't they start showing Waverly during a flood event on the site? They, it seems like they did that one year. We show it, we, they just don't show forecasted. Okay. So La Crosse will forecast Charles City and Des Moines will forecast uh, Janesville, and we interpolate. That gets us through uh, water sewer. So basically, the left we have solid waste, airport, um, and uh, the project accounts. Do you want to take kind of kind of end here for the day and come back to it, and then we can do this either at the February second or schedule a special kind of hour and a half meeting workshop. We'll leave it up to you. We're flexible. We're here. I'd rather have something else besides today. Okay. Split for today. <laughs> yeah, David has family stuff. Uh, we'll send out I think we better call it for a day. Okay. We'll and send in the flow table. would be better if we could just do it a part of something. Monday. Maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know that we can add a... I'd have to ask Carla about adding for Monday. I think it's a little late. But. February 2nd? We have five public hearings. You have five public hearings. But then you have two agenda <laughs> items. Yeah, right. You only have two agenda items on the on the yeah, second. That'd be fine. And remember, setting the public hearing, it's really primarily for our tax rate, I believe. And so we'll keep the we'll keep moving with this 1405 tax rate and using the backfill. Um, and then uh, on the second, we can have some more discussion on the enterprise and projects. Once we set the public hearing on the second, and then we still had, you had a day planned for us to meet again before we actually come to actual votes on it? Is so that? what the way we did it actually was, so we set it on the second. Right now we're setting it for February 16th, knowing that um, if something comes up or if you have to table it, you have basically one more meeting in March where okay. we can adjust it if needed. So, or if something happens on the, between now and the second or on the second, then we can say, okay, just hold the public hearing in, in March. When do the bids for the dry run come in again? February 5th. Okay. So that will, we'll have that information have for the public 16th. hearing. Okay. Yep. That will change probably quite a bit. On the, or yeah. Could. Ho hopefully could it'll, change. it'll give us some more capacity in that, that debt levy. Some other things like, yep, okay. Exactly. Yep. Um, but right now, again, like I said, we'll keep moving forward. We'll look for a time on uh, likely on the second, so we don't have to add special nightly meetings um, over the next week. And we'll we'll keep kind of going as we have been. Again, a lot of these budgets are pretty flat, pretty stable. There's not major changes, and so that'll give us time to talk about projects we want to do and have more input um, just on where we're headed. I think overall, it seems like there's broad consensus that. It's a workable budget, and I think we're in a pretty good place, but we'll just keep that discussion going. Okay. 
Motion to adjourn. We adjourn. Second. All in favor signify with yes. 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 yes.